stopped offense. All of those things are good signs for AM. But can't play till the second half, so he's relegated to coach and cheerleader in the first half. What do you expect? Well, I thought what was interesting is AM recently elected their captains. Johnny Menzel was not a captain elected by the team. But I fully expect him and want him to act like a captain today. How does he act on the sideline when either one of those quarterbacks is playing? What kind of energy does he bring to the equation? Hopefully he comes out here and acts like he is playing in this game from snap number one. That's what he needs to show from a leadership standpoint. And you just saw the other two quarterbacks who we'll see in the first half. To tell you about those guys, let's bring in Tom Luganville. Well, guys, both of these players have vastly different styles, whether it's going to be Matt Jokel, the pocket passer that, you know, you're probably not going to have that athletic dynamic trait to extend plays or keep plays alive. You're going to have some pinpoint passing from within the pocket, and I think a reliance upon a heavy run game. Conversely, what Kenny Hill, the true freshman, may lack in overall experience, he certainly is going to make up with in athleticism, regardless of who's under center. I can tell you this, the pace and the tempo of this offense will not change. They'll be going fast. With more, Mark Schwartz. Tom, the Aggies are going to be playing shorthanded today. Some breaking news here at Kyle Field. Eight Aggies have been suspended for part or all of this game, including Johnny Manziel. Five of those suspensions announced moments ago. Six of the players are defensive starters. Among those suspended on defense, linebacker Stephen Jenkins, cornerback Devontae Harris, defensive end Gavin Stansbury, nose guard Kurt Defensive backs to Shazer Everett and Floyd Raven Sr. and starting wide receiver Edward Pope. They were suspended two games. Pope, Jenkins, Harris, and Stansbury for violations of Texas A&M Athletic Department rules. Dave? So, Mark, that is six defensive starters for Texas A&M not available in the first half. Kevin Sumlin will get to Shazer Everett back for the second half as well as, of course, the starting quarterback. Someone led the Aggies to an 11 win season and a Cotton Bowl victory against Oklahoma. Hoping for bigger things here in year two in the SEC. Trey Williams and Ben Molina are deep. As Chris Boswell will boot it away for Rice, and the ball blows off the tee. I think it's safe to say that there's no fan base in America that has anticipated a kickoff more and wanted to get to their first game more than this fan base here in College Station with everything that's happened this offseason. Triple digit temperatures here in Aggie Land. Trey Williams thought about taking it out. It'll come out to the 25 for Texas A&M. And Matt Jokel will get the start. He's played in five games, thrown 11 passes. He is the twin brother of former offensive lineman here, Luke Jokel, who was the number two pick in the NFL draft by Jacksonville. And I fully anticipate, as Lugan, Tom Luganville said earlier, that this pace will be the same as you have seen last year from the A&M offense. Jokelo Jr. from Arlington, Texas. And they'll hand it off. Molina finds a running lane off the left side to the 33-yard line for about eight yards. Then Molina rushed for over 800 yards a year ago. As the fast-paced Aggies get ready for play two. And it's Molina again picking up the first down across the 35-yard line. I do anticipate to see a little bit more in the running game with Matt Jokel at quarterback. He doesn't have that element, obviously, of moving with his feet. But certainly they have a bevy of running backs, and Molina is the leader. First throw by Jokel into traffic and pulled in by Malcolm Kennedy at the 41-yard line for a four-yard pickup. It certainly helps a young quarterback when you can get your first first down on two running plays and then throw the ball on first down. And an easy pitch and catch there on his first pass. New core of wide receivers for the most part, save Mike Evans. Who set AM freshman records last year for receiving. As Joe Bull's going to fire it deep for Evans. And Evans beat his man, but a bad throw. Incomplete. It'll bring up third down. 
Evans got bumped a little bit. Oh, I think that's why the timing was off between he and Jokel, but brings up a third and six here. It'll be interesting to see first drive how new offensive coordinator Clarence McKinney decides to call this with an inexperienced quarterback. McKinney replacing Cliff Kingsbury, who got his first win as Texas Tech head coach last night. Jokel with tons of time to throw. Now flushed out of the pocket, and Jokel nailed at the 40 yard line. So Texas A&M will have to kick the football. Kelty Bauer might be the best player on defense for Rice, got pressure. And a tackle made by Michael Kutzler. Great stop by that Rice defense. They had good coverage there on third and six. Nowhere for Jokel to go with the ball. Good decision not to try to force things early in this football game. A punt is not a bad play at A&M. They don't see many punts, but right. they got to remember it's not a bad play, especially early in this game. Drew Kayser will boot it to Bryce Callahan. A booming punt that's fielded inside the five. Fair caught at the four yard line. 55 yard punt. 55. Whether you talk to Chad Morris at Clemson, guys, whether you talk to Gus Malzahn at Auburn or Chip Kelly, when you're going to run a pace and tempo offense, it is critical to get first downs. So whatever happens going forward with this two-quarterback system, they've got to get first downs to sustain that pace. And let's see how their defense fares, Luke, with, again, more than half of the starting unit suspended for this first half, and many of them for two games. Rice does have a senior quarterback in Taylor McCarr. And he's going to throw from deep out of this end zone. Got a wide open man. Across the 25-yard line is Connor Sella. Out to the 30. That's a 26-yard game. Taylor McCarg has got some moxie to him. He's not going to back down, despite the fact he's playing here at Kyle Field. Backed up inside his five-yard line. Great play-action pass on the first down. And that's a big gain. And... Rice in better position at the 30. They got to the line quickly, but now taking their time on the snap. AM showing pressure. And McCarr going to short throw this time to the back. Charles Ross and ridden out of bounds. And you'll see McCarr do the little things right. You saw in the first play, didn't panic, backed up in his own end zone, makes an accurate throw that time. Mark Schneider, defensive coordinator for AM, decides to bring a field blitz, and he just shuffles away from it a little bit and finds the open receiver. Very experienced quarterback making his fourth opening day start. Had some injury problems. Hurt his left shoulder last year. I hope he can stay healthy. They're not real confident in their backup. Here's a little option by McCarr, who ran the triple option in high school, makes a beautiful cut. He's loose. Inside the 30-yard line. McCarg inside the 10 and finally dragged down. What an opening drive by the Owls. It started on their four, and they're inside the Texas A&M 10. One of the things Mark Schneider, defensive coordinator, likes to do is come off the edge with a corner blitz, and that's what happened on that play. Perfect call, option away. Here's Ross into the pile, pushing the pile. And down to the one. Boy, surprised to see that. A smaller Rice offensive line blowing AM's D line off the ball. But you got a lot of guys on that D line who don't play. Haven't played before. You have to replace Demontre Moore, Sean Porter, guys like that. Here's Ross, and it's a touchdown. How about this start for the Owls? That's a 96 yard drive that only took about two and a half minutes. David Bailiff comes into Kyle Field with a confident group, despite the fact that everybody thinks they're outmatched. They get the ball inside their five-yard line and go right down the field with play pass. Very impressive. And finishing off with a strong run by Ross. And Boswell on for the point after. Texas A&M last year scored on its opening drive every game. First game of 2013, they don't score. They have to punt. And it's Rice looking like AM. Going 96 yards, a touchdown. This is College Football on ESPN, presented by Cars.com. 
Back here at Kyle Field, Rice up early 7-0 over Texas A&M. And so much, Brian, of what you talked about in our opening segment about watching Johnny Manziel on the sideline. How is he interacting with Matt Jokel? And to this point, hasn't been a lot of, a lot of interaction yet. Uh, Johnny Manziel's kind of kept into the shadows just a little bit. Doesn't necessarily look disinterested, but hasn't necessarily been engaged as well. Just saw him come up and speak a few words quietly into the side of the helmet of Matt Jokel with a nice little pat on the tush, getting ready to go out for the second stanza. Yeah, Lugs, I don't think he needs to be up running around. I just think he needs to be supportive in, in his approach towards Matt Jokel. And you saw him standing right there next to each other. They were talking a little bit about normally the quarterbacks will talk about the first play in the upcoming series. And that's Jake Spavital standing right next to Johnny with a little smile. But have the, uh, you don't want to be too involved, you know, Dave. You just want to be able to have that conversation with the offensive quarter, things that you see from the sideline. Another good kickoff. And this time Williams will take it out. And Williams across the 20, up to the 25 yard you know, line. There's various different styles of leading. Some guys are rah-rah, some guys are quiet, some guys are by example. I think to some degree, and I'm standing right next to Johnny Manziel right now, I think he wants to give Matt Jokel the opportunity to be the guy, have this be his offense right now, support him, and the best way you support a quarterback is to get him some confidence early so he can get into a groove, and now all of a sudden the offense will start rolling. And isn't there a concern about being overbearing? Yeah, absolutely. Jokel out there for his second series. From the AM 25-yard line. Another inside run. They had success with this on their first possession. Then Molina gets about five here. Cutzler made the tackle at the 30-yard line. And if it were me down there in Manziel's position, I would be as involved with the offensive line as I would with the quarterbacks. It's not just about the quarterback. Jokel to throw, and the sideline pass pulled in by Darrell Walker for a first down and a gain of six yards. Great throw there on uh, to get a first down. And I think just to finish that point, you want to be involved with all the guys that you're going to be interacting with, the wide receivers, the offensive line. Those are These are the starters out there that Johnny Manziel is going to be interacting with. And it's important they see his energy level. Jokel fakes it to Molina and fires complete to Evans. Across midfield into the 48 of Rice. Evans preseason second team all SEC after 82 catches and over 1,100 yards last year. You see what they like about Joko. Tall, big, stand in the pocket, able to deliver that football. Oh, great move by Molina to get away from a defender and get positive yardage to the 45. Cody Bauer thought he had Molina in the backfield, but the 5, 990 pound back able to break free. So second down and six on the 45 of Rice. On the delayed draw, Molina finds a hole inside the 35-yard line. An 11-yard pickup for Ben Molina. This is an important drive for AM. First drive of the season. You get stopped by Rice. They come out, punch you in the mouth with a 95-yard drive. You've got an answer here. Here's Molina again. And he is inside the 25. Another first down for Ben Molina before Paul Porras makes the tackle. You know, a healthy run game can be a young quarterback's best friend. And take a look at Matt Jokel's body language right now. Got a little bit of a swagger to him. Trey Carson out there now for Molina. And Carson will get it. Cuts it upfield. Inside the 15-yard line, a nine-yard game. For Trey Carson, a transfer from Oregon who played 10 games there in 2011 and set out last year. This is the guy that Coach Sumlin is excited about. 230 pounds. He's a different back, can be that downhill presence. Here's Carson again up the gut. Why does he do anything else at this point? Rice hasn't been able to stop the run. It's first and goal from the seven-yard line. And when you think about the way AM may look a little bit different this year, you have Molina, who's kind of a scat back and, and can have a power element, but you add Trey Carson into the mix, and that's a completely different physical way of playing football. Back to Carson. He gets stood up this time at the four-yard line by James Radcliffe. Still, it's a gain of three. Exactly number 10. This is a new group up front for the most part. We mentioned Luke Jokel 
drafted number two overall. So Jake Matthews, the outstanding tackle, who was on the right side last year, moves to the left. He's the son of Bruce Matthews. You got a new center and some other folks moving around. New positions on that O-line. Molina's back in the game, and he gets the call on second down. Pinball's off the defender and score. Touchdown, a and &M. Well, they ran it every play with the exception of two on that drive. And they respond after the touchdown by Rice with a 10 play 75 yard drive. And Bertolette puts it through to tie it at seven. This is maybe what we're going to see from this AN offense more on the ground this year. They score a lot of points. They have no problem with that. Impressive on the power on the ground. And that got Johnny Manziel happy. This is Dick's Sporting Goods Kickoff Week. Isn't it great to have college football back? Absolutely. The end of the BCS era, final season before they go to a playoff next year. Isn't that great, too? <laughs> yes. Isn't it amazing that that has become a back burner subject with all the Johnny yeah. Manziel stuff? Yeah, it really is amazing. And I think you see now there's an appropriate level of conversation and engagement by uh, by Johnny and uh, when, when nobody else is watching what is he doing with with Matt Joko I think he's uh, he's been supportive and informative and been impressed with what he's done so far and in talking with some of the players and coaches yesterday they told us look Johnny Menzel in the locker room he's just another guy he's just one of the guys we don't see him differently and especially in two days where it's football 24 yeah. 7. You're not paying attention to what's going on outside. And I think people outside of the program don't realize how insulated this team is. When you go to training camp, you don't have the television on all the time in the eating uh, facility and in the training room and in the weight room. You just, you're just being a normal, everyday guy. And that's what Johnny Manziel has been inside that locker room. In fact, there was one day where the TV was on and Manziel was on the TV and Johnny got up and said, hey, can you turn it off? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would too. Still having trouble keeping the ball on the tee. We were not allowed to speak with Johnny Manziel, but Texas A&M has not provided any media access to Manziel at all. I think the bottom line, Dave, at the end of the day, no matter what happens outside, any player, if you go out on that field and you perform in practice and in camp, everybody on the team is going to respect you. And I think that's what it's come down to, and that's what happened with A&M and Johnny Manziel. Jeremy Eddington and Mario Hall are deep. And a short kick. Hall across the 15. And he's got room. Hall hurdles the kicker. And Bertolette lost his lid and made the tackle at the 42. Let's say hello to Reese Davis now in the studio. Dave, how are you? Happy football Saturday. If you had my first cut in, it's when I said trickeration. You win. Villanova and Boston College. Jamal Abdul Rahman on the nifty fake punt. And the Wildcats have a 14 7 lead over BC at the break. Reese, the busiest man in college football, called the game on Thursday. Studio today calls a Monday night game. Florida State Pitt. Taylor McCarr down the first drive for Rice. 57 rushing yards, 31 passing yards. He'll throw here. Got a man wide open. Dante Moore into AM territory at the 44 yard line. Now Rice finished strong last year. Won its final five games under David Bailiff. They went to the Armed Forces Bowl and beat Air Force. And they got almost everybody back. And they've got the right approach, Dave. They're coming in here. They're not scared. I mean, they're going to take their best shot. They realize some of their limitations, but so far, so good. Here's Charles Ross, a 230-pound back, rips through the Aggie defense. Down to the 37-yard line for about six. Donnie Bags, the middle linebacker, made the tackle. 
huge hole in the middle of that AM defensive line. That, that is not what Mark Snyder wants to see. Obviously, we know they're playing with some backups in this game, but these are some of the players as you start to develop your defensive line rotation, you want guys that you can depend on that can be gap sound, and right now they're getting gashed. Again, six starters on defense for AM suspended. Several announced just before kickoff. They'll get one guy back at halftime to Shazer Everett, a starting corner. Play fake for McCard, and it's incomplete. Trying to hit Connor Sella. So it'll bring up third down and four at the 37 yard line. I think what you've seen from AM is they're bringing a lot of pressure early in this game. Mark Snyder's philosophy was if I have young players, sometimes I'm going to blitz, contrary to what you would think. But if I can keep them on the same track, then I know where they're absolutely going to be. They don't have to read anything. Just go get the football, and that's what they've approached so far. First third down of the opening quarter for the Rice Owls. They need to reach the 33. And they do have a kicker who's got a strong leg. McCarr in trouble. Steps up and gets the first down and keeps going. McCarr inside the 25 and taken out of bounds at the 19. That's an 18-yard gain on third down and four. The card looking like the AM quarterback that normally does this stuff. It was good coverage downfield, and it just did lost contain. On the outside, that was Tyrone Taylor, the defensive end, a young player. He's a true freshman and just didn't keep contain on the card. on the 18-yard line of Texas A&M. Got a 96-yard scoring drive to start the game. McCard dumps it off. Ross down the sideline. Ross runs over a defender. Touchdown. He took on Howard Matthews and spilled him on the goal line. Uh, this looks like Texas A&M's offense right here. They bring pressure, finds the open guy, and then a physical presence. Ross just runs over Howard Matthews, and Matthews could be a starter on this. Is going to be a starter on this secondary for A&M. Impressive drive by Rice. I know these are backups for the most part, but it's, these are still SEC players, and they're getting shredded here in the first quarter. One after by Boswell makes it 14-7. Rice and Charles Ross with five touchdowns all of last year has two so far. And there's nothing Johnny Football can do about it right now. ESPN College Football is presented by Cars.com. Get the right car without all the drama. Cars.com. All drive, no drama. And in part by Dick's Sporting Goods. Every season starts at Dick's. One of the great traditions here at Texas A&M, midnight yell practice. Twelve hours later, nobody yelling. Everybody shocked at well, what's taking place here in the first quarter. Mark Snyder's yelling on the sideline to his defense. <laughs> I can tell you that. Giving up 14 points and 153 yards to Rice in three and a half minutes. And I understand you got, you know, some guys out, starters out, but the, they've been impressed with some of these replacements and second team guys in camp, and they just haven't come out and performed early in this football game. And give credit to Rice. They've come out with a good plan. Play action, run the ball. McCarg has made plays with his feet. That's been the difference in the game so far. Kevin Sumlin told us yesterday he thinks Rice can win Conference USA. He knows that league well coming from Houston prior to taking over at AM last year. Here's Molina on the kick return. And he will not make it to the 20. Wrapped up and dropped at the 17-yard line. Moments ago, Johnny Manziel going over to some of the defensive players and chatting with them. What is Rice doing that's making them so successful right now? Well, I think, I think first and foremost, their tempo. They've come out and, and they've gone up tempo, which doesn't allow the defense to get set, especially a young defense that's trying to recognize formations and, and know where all the players are and, and read their keys. It's very difficult when you go up tempo and it's hot. And Taylor McCarg has made those plays with his feet. Here's that delayed draw on the inside handoff. And Molina has eight yards to the 25 top. 
Yeah, guys, you know, a lot of three-man front that we saw on that last drive for Texas A&M, trying to create maybe some confusion, but in doing so, also out of position and not gap sound, which Mark Snyder, the defensive coordinator, discussed with us yesterday. Out on the flat it goes, and stumbling is true freshman Jeremy Taboyo, but he does pick up the Aggie first down on the 28th. Taboyo is one of six or seven true freshman wide receivers that have come in to AM. They're excited about him as well as Seals, Ricky Seals Jones. We haven't seen him yet, but a lot of talent on the perimeter for AM offensively. Molina straight on to the 31 for about three. Well, you got Mike Evans back, but after that, you've got a bunch of guys that haven't played or well, Malcolm haven't Kennedy, been able to catch a game. Yeah, Malcolm Kennedy came on at the end of last year, made some big plays for this offense, but certainly the loss of Swope and Wojciku are the big ones. Joko's pass broken up over the middle by Corey Frazier, the son of Minnesota Vikings head coach Leslie Frazier. Malcolm Kennedy was the intended receiver. So third down and seven for Texas A&M. How will Joko handle this? Pressure coming. And Joko going to go deep. And a beautiful throw. Incomplete. The hit made by Frazier on Taboyo may have made the difference there. Taboyo had it in his hands until contact. That's a great play by Frazier. Goes for the football all the way to the ground. You got to control that ball to the ground. And Frazier gets a hand on Taboyo. Frazier's a big player, 6'1", 215 pounds, and he used all of that length to knock that football out at the bottom. We talked about suspensions. Rice suspended its best defensive player, Philip Gaines, for one game. He's the preseason defensive player of the year in Conference USA. But the guy stepping in for him done a good job so far. Deep kickoff, fair caught, or punt rather, fair caught inside the 15 by Bryce Callahan. Rice's offense, dare I say, unstoppable in the first quarter. <laughs> We'll be back on the field when we return. Back here in College Station, we welcome you to the SEC on ESPN. More SEC action throughout the day on ESPN and ABC, culminating in a great one between Georgia and Clemson out of the ACC. Saturday Night Football presented by Windows, part of Dick's Sporting Goods kickoff week. Aaron Murray against Taj Boyd, two of the better quarterbacks in college football. Gosh, and that, that offense of Clemson is going to be going so fast in that heat. December or August 31st in Death Valley. The big key in that game, I think, is can Georgia keep up stamina-wise? Interesting formation. They've got Turner Peterson, the running back, under center. And the quarterback, McCard, now in motion to the bottom of your screen. And I'm not fooled. Now why would you go to a trick play when you've had success handing off, dropping back, and throwing the ball? I don't know. I wouldn't. Uh, you've had so much success in play action and moving the pocket a little bit. Probably something that they worked on. You know, coaches work on things during the week and during the offseason, and sometimes they have success and they can't help themselves. They have to call it. Just do what you've been doing. It's been working. Actually, did pick up two yards. McCard back in his more traditional position for second and eight. And a big running lane. Turner Peterson tripped up, or he might still be gone. Howard Matthews on the stop, but it's a 12-yard gain to the 26-yard line. You got young players. Claiborne, 48, the linebacker. You get two defensive players in the same gap, and you're in trouble. And that's the biggest bugaboo when you play young players is they don't keep their gap sound. McCard with tons of time. Now in trouble. Escapes pressure. McCarr almost runs into the official and now completes it to the 33-yard line to Jordan Taylor. Taylor had 57 catches last year. Was the MVP of their bowl game. We talked about the moxie from Taylor McCarg. He's got the escapability. He's not Johnny Manziel, but he's got good feet. And a bad throw there. Trying to hit Taylor. There's a penalty flag now. That's just a miscommunication there. Trying to go so fast that you can't forget to communicate from quarterback to wide receiver. Matt Austin, our referee. 
SEC officiating crew here today. Prior to the snap, false start on the offense. Failure for all 11 players to get set. Five-yard penalty, repeat second down. So it actually works out in their favor. They get another down. It's got a second, or third and two. It is second and seven. But they've handled second and long pretty well so far. And m is in a three-man front. What does Mike Taylor McCarr do? Call the back back in the backfield. Look for a run. McCarr throws wide of the intended receiver, Jordan Taylor. Now it's third down and seven. Bryce has had so much success running the football in between the tackles against that three-man front. Surprised they didn't do it there, but brings up a third and seven here. Exclusive passing situation. Who's going to replace the pass rush for AM? You lose to Montre Moore and Sean Porter. They need to find somebody to replace those guys. Last year, Moore had 12 and a half sacks. They've got freshmen on the D line right now for the most part. Mike clock at five on third down and seven for Rice for the 14 7 lead. McCart airing it out. Jump ball. What a catch! by Jordan Taylor at the 42-yard line. They were worried about Taylor's height. He's six foot five, 210 pounds, and Honeycutt gets over there late. He's six foot two, it's not like he's a chump, but Taylor just goes up and elevates. Tremendous play. So they convert third down and seven. From the Rice 42-yard line. They have 188 yards of total offense in the first quarter against an SEC defense. Another big running lane. Turner Peterson straight on for seven more to the 49. This is an experienced offensive line, which certainly helps. Absolutely, but you still have to be able to get off blocks. And that time, Mark Snyder brings a safety blitz right in the gap where they're running the football. He gets kicked out, and it results in a huge hole. They just moved John Hody to left tackle to a, a tight end position on the right side for this play here at second and three. McCarg in trouble. And does well to get rid of the pass. Dante Moore was the intended receiver. Donnie Bags had pressure on McCarg, so third down and three for Rice. They're two for two on third down so far. Now, if I'm Taylor McCarg, a senior quarterback, played a lot of football, got a lot of young players on AM, a big third and short here. Might want to use a snap count, get a cheap one. Ready to run the ball, too. You got Charles Ross at 235 pounds, yep. who's been dashing the defense. But it'll be a pass for McCarg. Oh, it's dropped. It would have been a first down. Turner Peterson could not make the play. McCarg took a shot. And it's fourth down, and Rice will try to pin Texas A&M deep here. Well, McCarg did his part, throws the ball right on target to Peterson. You got to make this play. Nice route with patience, and you got to come down with that, and McCarg takes a big hit. A sacrifice for your team. Alonzo Williams comes through and tattoos him. Travis Labhart, the deep man. First punt for Rice. Trying to keep it from going into the end zone, but they can. It will come off to the 20. Let's bring in now Mark Schwartz down on the field. You know, Dave, a lot of people outside the program wonder if all of the adventures of Johnny Manziel during the summer have created any divisiveness among the Texas A&M players. Well, R.C. Slocum, a coaching legend with the Aggies, was here 30 years, just inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame, says he spent lots of time with the team. As he put it, if you didn't know anything was going on, you wouldn't know anything was going on. 
No discernible tension, R.C. Slocum says. But in this game, with six defensive starters also sidelined, we've seen a little bit more tension than usual on the Aggies' sideline, Dave. And how about, Mark, the pressure now on Matt Joko replacing Manziel for now as Trey Carson runs left for three or four yards. Zach Pat makes the tackle. It's a guy that's barely played. He's been on the program, but hasn't been out there when the bullets are locked. Yeah. I think they have confidence in Matt Jokel so far. He hasn't done anything in this game to warrant uh, making a change to Kenny Hill unless they came into this game thinking they wanted to play both those players. Jokel dumps it off to Molina, who's terrific out in space. There's a penalty marker down as Molina is dropped out of bounds at the 40-yard line after a 16-yard gain, and now another penalty flag comes in. Alex Lyons with likely a late hit. There was another flag back near the line of scrimmage. And I think they're going to get Mike Evans, the wide receiver, blocking on the perimeter. We have two fouls on the play. Holding, offense number 13. Personal foul, horse collar tackle, number 41 defense. Those fouls offset. Replay, second down. Horse collar where you grab the back of the jersey and yank down on the runner when it's outside the tackle box or downfield. Here's the hold by Evans. Just you, you get that hand on the outside, and they're going to call that. And I didn't see a horse yeah, collar there. Like that horse arm collar. was around the back of his neck, but he did not bring him down by Here's true freshman Ricky Seals Jones, his first collegiate catch, and it's a first down. Six foot five, 225 pounds, mostly a quarterback in high school. They'll run it here on first down. And the run by Carson gets about three yards. Tom? You know how quickly they got that first down? They immediately got to the line of scrimmage. I love what the what I call confidence throws coming from Matt Jokel right now. Short, underneath, simplified, get him some confidence, keep the chains moving, and the big fellow, Ricky Seals-Jones, is going to get more and more touches as this game goes on. Rated number 61 under the ESPN 150, which are a big part of Tom. Here's Carson trying to bounce off a tackle. He stopped at the 40-yard line. So it's a gain of close to six yards. Third and short coming up. There was a Rice player that lost his helmet. Gabe Baker starting safety, so he'll have to go out for one play. Third and one. And Carson, the big back, picks it up to the 43-yard line. Another helmet on the field for a Rice player. Yeah, and that's what they that's what they want Carson to do. They want him to be that short yardage back inside the red zone and goal line where he can just power over defenders. And that's an element that I think Kevin Sumlin wants to have. Molina can do a little bit of it, but on a consistent basis in the SEC, you really need two guys to do it. Got a penalty flag. This is going to be a legal substitution here on AM, you would imagine. They also have Brandon Williams, a transfer from Oklahoma, who's got a foot injury. And then Trey Williams, who was a good receiver out no of the backfield. For illegal substitution. Okay, no foul. So Johnny Manziel will have four backs to work with. They're all very different when he gets in there in the second half. Joker with tons of time. Got to throw a deep ball down the sideline. And another drop. This one by Darrell Walker. The defender may have gotten a hand on the football. Looked like a pretty good throw. Yeah, I think this this could have been thrown a little bit farther, Dave. Perfect throw would have been down the field and outside. When you throw a fade route, you want that ball to be four yards from the sideline. When you bring it back inside to the numbers, you give the defender a chance to get a fingertip on it. That was Bryce Callahan who did just that. Jokel with a pop pass to Kennedy. In the Rice territory to the 40-yard line. Close to 17 yards on that play. And that's the first play that's kind of looked a little bit like the, what the offense Johnny Manziel runs with play action over the middle. Back to the ground in Molina trying to pick a hole. But there's not much there. Penalty marker down in the secondary. Molina picks up about three or four.
The official sorting it out. Is shocking the right word for what we've seen here in the first quarter? Well, not when you have six defensive starters out. I mean, it's uh, they've struggled certainly on defense, and, and then the offense looks a little bit different because they don't have the element of the quarterback run. So I, I wouldn't use the word shocking. Certainly, I know Kevin Sumlin is disappointed. On the defense, 12th player failed to get off before the snap. Five-yard penalty, repeat first down. So it'll be first and five. What likely will be the final play of the quarter. Jokel is 6 of 10 passing for 51 yards. And they uh, started the clock and they're ready for play. And so that's the, that's the end of the quarter. Still one more quarter to go for Johnny Manziel before he takes the field. When he does, will his team be trailing? You're watching the SEC on ESPN. ESPN College Football presented by Cars.com, part of Dick's Sporting Goods Kickoff Week. Dave Pash, Brian Greasy, Tom Luganville, Mark Schwartz. 14-7. Rice leads the seventh-ranked team in the country that has national title aspirations. Of course, Johnny Menzel not playing in the first half, and a handful of starters on defense suspended just before kickoff. Penalty marker down here on first and five. Flag down. Talked about uh, some of the new players on defense because of the suspensions. Prior to the snap, snap infraction on the center. Five-yard penalty, still first out. Mentioned some guys shifting in the old line, some new receivers. New offensive coordinator for Johnny Manziel as well. Well, yeah, Clarence McKinney moves over from the running back coach position a year ago, and they also brought in Jake Spavital, uh, who's at West Virginia most recently. Both of those guys are coordinating this offense. Here's a wide receiver screen. Evans on the catch, wrapped up after minimal gain. Gain of two, another helmet off. Still in clear, he'll have to go to the sideline. And Clarence McKinney called the plays in the bowl game against Oklahoma where AM just ran past the Sooners. So he's had experience calling plays in that game, and we certainly haven't seen a drop off in speed. Jokel moving to his left, takes a shot, and hits Evans. Inside the race 15-yard line. A 25-yard game. Mike Evans came on last year in his first year playing and he just took off through the SEC, big wide receiver, a target downfield that the Rice de defensive backfield is not big enough to contend with Mike Evans. Off play action, another toss to Evans inside the 10. About nine there before Cutzler makes the stop. Jokel getting into a bit of rhythm here. Well, they're letting him throw the football. It was almost exclusive on the ground in the first two drives. Let him throw the football and take advantage of some of the talent that AM has on the perimeter. Jokel started the game. It's quarterbacked every play so far. Good cutback run by Carson. Stood up on the goal line. And he'll be short. But it is a first down. So it'll be first and goal from the one for Texas A&M. And I think you probably have seen Clarence McKinney come in with a conservative approach early in this game. First quarter of the first game, new quarterback, some guys out. Let's be safe and run the football. But start of the second quarter, they've opened it up a little bit. They go with Carson and Molina in the backfield, and David Bailiff calling a timeout. Timeout. Rice, the first time out of the half. Texas A&M trying to tie the game early second quarter in College Station. An impressive drive engineered by Matt Jokel, junior quarterback who's starting for Johnny Manziel, suspended for the first half. He has A&M at the one-yard line of Rice. First down and goal. Jokel 9 of 13 passing for 87 yards. Had the help of an outstanding run game. Molina with 57 yards on the ground. Trey Carson with 40. The difference down here now. You've got options with Carson to slam it in, or you've got play action with two tight ends in the game. It'll be Carson, and he's in. Touchdown, Texas A&M. Trey Carson's first as an Aggie.
I'll tell you the biggest difference that I've seen in this AM offense is they have added some beef at some of the skill positions. A year ago, they didn't quite have that. Had a lot of scat backs, but you bring in Carson, you bring in Cameron Clear, the new tight end who's 270 pounds, and you can start to run power to, to inside that five yard line. 12 play, 80 yard drive, and Bertolette ties it. At 14, early in the second quarter, Matt Jokel start to get comfortable. The running game has certainly helped as Carson from one yard out scores and Johnny Menzel cheerleading on the sideline. They're tied with Rice. ESPN College Football. Brought to you by Adidas Originals. Explore the new roundhouse instinct at adidas.com slash originals. And Applebee's. Applebee's two for $20 menu just got even better with the new Honey Pepper Grill. This year's, quote, game of the century, two weeks away against Alabama. But right now, A&M got their hands full with Rice. They'll play Sam Houston State next week before hosting the Tide, of course. One in Tuscaloosa last year. A couple signature Heisman plays by Johnny Manziel in that ball game. Made him the first freshman to win the award. Trying to become the second to win two. Archie Griffin, 74-75. Only been a dozen players who got the chance to come back and win it a second time. Short kick. And fielded at the seven by Eddington. He actually called for a fair catch. I think he was waving off the other return man, but they ruled that he made a fair catch signal. A colossal gaffe by Eddington. <laughs> oh, Boy, you are tough. I tell you, I think he's just trying to, here he is way back here, and he's trying to clear. That looks like a fair yeah, catch signal a to fair me. fair catch to me. You know, it was a pop-up kick initially from, from a and and I think it just traveled a little bit farther than he thought, but... I don't know what he's doing there, to be honest with you. That defines that's, that's, fair catch, though. Okay, I, I'll go back on your colossal gaffe. <laughs> You're going to give me that one. <laughs> yeah. They get Turner Peterson in at quarterback here. They tried this earlier, and it didn't work. Charles Ross is next to him. It'll be Ross, and he powers past the 10 muscles to the 15-yard line. It's an 8-yard gain for big Charles Ross. True freshman Darian Claiborne, one of several true freshmen starting for AM today because of the suspensions. And after watching uh, the first half of this game, I, I agree with Coach Sumlin. This is a team that is going to compete in Conference USA. Again, Peterson lined up in the Wildcat position. But this offensive line has been impressive with the way they've come off the ball, physical nature. Find a hole is Peterson, and he picks up the first down of the 19. Alonzo Williams on the stop. You know, guys, the Rice offensive coordinator, John Reagan, he's really got himself a buffet of offensive philosophy here. He started out under Fisher to Barry at Air Force, so you've seen some of the option principles already today. We saw the speed option from Taylor McGard. Now we've seen some of the zone read principles. Also worked under Mark Mangino as part of that How Mummy. Mike Leach passing tree, so you've seen a lot of the spread elements. It's a lot to prepare for with a veteran offensive line and quarterback. Rice is in good shape early on. Well, one of their options, Turner Peterson, shaking up on that last play. Down to the first down top. First down to the 19. McCarg on the keeper. And steps out after a minimal gain. Jordan Taylor was out there blocking Howard Matthews, trying to free his quarterback, but. You don't see that very, very often where you have all kinds of different philosophies coming into one. A lot of times when you try to do too many things, you're not a master of one of them. And that can come back to hurt you. But give John Reagan credit. He has coached this team up well, and they're executing. Second down and eight from the Rice 21. They're able to recover from that fair catch on the kickoff. Ross, big hole across the 30-yard line. Like a bowling ball, runs over three defenders, and his knee never hit the ground. He kept going, 
and picked up more than 20 yards. They can't bring this guy to the ground. Well, Mo Claiborne comes right off the edge, number 48, true freshman linebacker, and he has that responsibility. You can't choose to just take the quarterback. You've got to play it slow and may have to take that running back if he takes the football. It's just a young player mistake. 146 rushing yards by Rice. Charles Ross is 44 on five carries. Got a stoppage here. They may look further at this to see if Ross Previous was down. Under further review. The ruling is any part of your body other than foot or hand, and you're down. And the ruling in the field was he was not down. He lands on a player. Hard to tell if his forearm was down. It looked like the, uh, the back of his hand was down. But certainly there's no knee on the ground. Hard to tell from that angle. It's good to me. <laughs> Ruling on the field is confirmed. He was not down. His knee did not touch. Forearm did not touch. So it will be first down for Rice on its 43-yard line. Charles Ross, 235-pound senior, rushed for 800 yards last year and five touchdowns. Already has two scores in this game, a rushing touchdown and a receiving touchdown when he ran over a 200-pound safety in Howard Matthews on the goal line. Taylor McCarg, senior quarterback for Rice, has been steady so far. He'll throw it here. And that pass into traffic, incomplete. Dante Moore, the intended receiver. You had two defenders closing, Clay Honeycutt and true freshman Alex Caesar Jr. They're concerned about his lack of size against some of the bigger Rice, receiver, or, uh, yes, Rice receivers in this game. going to play anyway before the uh, suspensions. The Shazer Everett will likely replace him though when he comes back in the second half. He was only suspended for the first half. Six starters in all for AM though suspended. Ross again to midfield breaks tackles powers close to another first down at the 47. Take a look at the gaps on the inside all these guys coming and blitz and, and they don't keep their gap and it's just too easy. Mark Snyder defensive coordinator is trying to get a stop by taking some risks and bringing secondary but if you don't keep your gap you're going to get gashed. Third down and about a half a yard at the 48 yard line of Texas A&M. So they just hand it off here to Ross and let him push the pile. We've got no safeties in the ball game. Everybody's up on the line of scrimmage. It'll be McCarg on the fake. Drag down in the backfield. True freshman Darian Claiborne made the stop and they lost three yards. So they're going to punt it here rather than risk turning it over on downs at midfield. Uh, that's a great play by Claiborne. Coaching staff really likes his intelligence. He's very vocal. He's become somewhat of a leader early on as a true freshman because he studies the game, plays hard, and knows where he's going. Great play on third down. Labhart, the return man, and this punt sails into the end zone. Now the defense finally stepping up for Texas A&M. True freshman Darian Claiborne making a play on third down, dragging down the quarterback and forcing a punt. An outstanding lineup of games. Dick Sporting Goods kickoff week, including two tonight. Alabama, the top-ranked team, two-time defending national champs, facing Virginia Tech, LSU, and TCU in the Cowboys Classic at 9. College football primetime presented by Hampton Hotels. Texas A&M coming off an 80-yard scoring drive. We'll see if that 
Here's the quarterback, Joe, with some confidence. He hits the freshman, Seals Jones, for about six yards to the 26-yard line. Yeah, if I'm Clarence McKinney, offensive coordinator for AM right now, I'm going to keep the pace going. I'm going to start throwing the ball a little bit, taking some more chances, maybe downfield with Mike Evans and Seals Jones. They can win those matchups on the outside deep whenever they want them. They'll run Molina. Twirled down shy of the first down by a couple of yards. Gains out of the lineup for Rice. You're talking about corners for the Owls right now. And Bryce Callahan at 5'10 and Darian Pollard at 5'9. They haven't given up the big play yet, but those opportunities are there one on one. And do you take it here on third down and short or just hammer it? Oh, Joko looking to throw it downfield. Wide open, Seals Jones. Seals Jones wasn't paying attention, but still got in for the touchdown. He didn't see that defender coming. He started to slow down. Either that or ran out of gas. But still, it's a 71-yard touchdown. Now you just get the feeling with this offense that Bryce was bending and not breaking, but eventually they were going to take the opportunity. They got the man-to-man -man coverage and the matchup they wanted and a great route inside on a double move from Seals Jones and the protection allowed Joko to deliver the football. First touchdown for Ricky Seals Jones, and they expect to be doing that a lot over the next few years here in College Station. And Bertolet gives Texas A&M its first lead. There was no safety in the middle of the field. Seals Jones saw it. Matt Joko saw it. When he's that wide open, you just want to put it on him, and Seals Jones does the rest. I think you're going to see a lot of this for a &M this season. Maybe that guy will be throwing it to him. Only the best make Applebee's famous two for 20 menu. Am I right, Carl? Applebee's new honey pepper grilled entrees combine the sweet taste of pure honey with just a hint of cracked black pepper. They're so good, they made our two for 20 menu, where we promise only the best make the cut. But Carl, how do we know these are really the best? You want proof? Roll the proof. Okay, Carl, I'm convinced. Taste what's new in the neighborhood, like our new honey pepper grill. Now part of our two for 20 menu. One app, two entrees, only 20 bucks. See you tomorrow at late night for half-priced apps. Quitting football maybe is not so hard, but quitting the team would be the one thing that I couldn't do. Get out! Get on the ground! That's it! If you want to play patty cake, you can go back home. Pick your feet up! Holy sugar! What is wrong with y'all? Do you think this is a game? It's not a game. I know how this thing works. You don't, but you're soon going to figure it out. Great route on the inside by Ricky Seals Jones. You see, he's going to come up here and act like he's going to block and then get over the top and watch the defender's eyes go into the backfield just for a split second. There it is. And now he's beat. And Ricky Seals Jones, very easy to get over the top for the touchdown. That was Julius White on defense. Gary Pollard on the kick return. And Pollard gets nailed at the 21 yard line. Let's check in with Reese Davis in the studio. All right, guys, Ohio State is slopping around a little bit with Buffalo. They turned it over on consecutive possessions. This in the first half for Jordan Hall got loose for a touchdown. He's well over 100 yards on the day, but nobody circles the wagons like the Buffalo Bulls. Just scored again to make it 30 to 20. Tommy Tuberville having a good debut. Daryl Hazel not so much on ESPNU. And on Wisconsin, Gary Anderson's team up 31 0 in the third. Now they're playing UMass in Madison. And then with a lead for the first time, 21-14. They have dominated the second quarter. Does Rice have a counter punch? They moved the ball at will in the first quarter on their opening two drives. There's a design quarterback run, and McCarr dives to the 27-yard line for a gain of five on the play. Either that or a busted yeah. play, hard to tell there. Yeah, I think it was a busted play, but when that happens, the quarterback, you just got to know what play is called and go where that running back was supposed to go, and that's what McCarr did, picked up four yards. They got Charles Ross behind McCarr for second and six. 
Play action, McCarg in trouble, and got the pass away complete. And it's a first down, Connor Sella on the grab. As McCarg delivered it with two defenders right on him. Well, McCarg could not have played better in this first half, in my opinion. I think he's taken some shots, he's delivered the football, he's been accurate. He's been in control of this offense, and right now you go down seven points, and you have an opportunity to get some points here before you go into halftime. He knows as a senior how important this drive is. Well, first down at the 34-yard line of Rice. Eight and a half to go till Johnny Football's return. That was another busted play there, and McCard hits the deck. No gain on the play. Well, guys, Texas A&M continuing to take chances on defense. I think they're figuring they might have an opportunity to get the quarterback into a bad play, get a potential turnover. That last time right there, guys, Ross in the backfield had no idea the play was being called. No, nope. that's uh, twice on this possession they've had metal errors. So second down and ten. You saw Mark Snyder, second-year defensive coordinator for A&M. Now they got more problems. They have to call a timeout here on offense. Their second timeout of the half. So Rice will talk about it, trailing 21-14 midway through the second quarter. We've always believed what you stand for says a lot about who you are. We are Texas A&M University, home of the 12th man. You wonder what's going on in his mind if he's antsy to get out there and finally take a snap. Been waiting a long time after an eventful offseason. A productive training camp for him, according to the coaches, where he's improved in a lot of areas. We'll get into that in the second half. Here's second and ten for Rice. Boy, they're having all kinds of issues here on this possession. Right to the snap. False start, 79 offense, five-yard penalty, still second down. Brian, it's clear the momentum has shifted in this game. Why? Well, I, I think AM finally, after so much talk in the offseason coming in, they've settled down. The first quarter was rocky on offense and defense. We've got so many young players playing on defense with six starters out because of suspension. I think they've settled down. Mark Snyder's done a nice job of settling down on the sideline, and now they're coming after this offense with a little bit of a different attack. They've been trying for a while to snap it on second and 10. <laughs> so it's second and 15 after the penalty. And McCard with nowhere to go, loses yardage inside the 25. Tyrone Taylor, one of the pass rushers that the AM coaches are hoping can replace Demontre Moore. He's a redshirt freshman from Houston. Some, something's going on in the backfield here, Dave. You know, McCarg and Ross have been on different pages the last three plays, and it's either communication or it's reading the defense, one or the other, but those two guys have got to get on the same page. They're killing this drive for Rice. Third and 21. On the 23-yard line. And it's a short throw to Sella. He'll get a chunk back, but not enough to punt. True freshman Jordan Mastro Giovanni, middle linebacker out of Dallas on the tackle. Well, and if, you, if you're Rice going into halftime, you know, you came out, you played well in this first quarter and a half, but towards the, se the second part of the second quarter, the communication is what's killing them, and those are unforced errors. Travis Labhart is deep, James Fairmont to punt. Rugby style kick that almost got blocked. Not a good punt. And is going to start near midfield. That's a shank. 19 yards on the punt. Smart guys. 
The tide has turned here in Aggieland. AM down 14 7 at one point. Not only has taken the lead, but sees momentum after a 19 yard punt. They've got the ball in midfield. Their quarterback, Matt Jokel, just starting to settle in. He's only got another six and a half minutes to enjoy it, though, with Manziel coming soon. Here's Trey Williams. 5'9", 190-pound back, getting nine yards before Corey Frazier brings him down in Rice territory at the 41. This is where you got to be really careful if you're Rice. Momentum has changed, and now you're going to get this up-tempo attack. Got to find a way to get off the football field. Jokel 12 of 16, passing. A buck 73 and a touchdown. And just as I say that, he throws one in the dirt, three yards short of the receiver, Jarrell Walker. We have not seen Kenny Hill. We were told yesterday by Coach Sumlin both guys would play. Do you think it's because the way Jokel has looked out there that someone's sticking with him? Oh, I don't know. It could have been a lot of things. He could have been just giving, pulling our leg, too. But, <laughs> but certainly Jokel has, uh, has played well early in this game. Coaches don't do that. No, no. Trey Williams with a first down run to the 37 yard line. But certainly Jokel has the experience. We were talking uh, with offensive coordinator Clarence McKinney, and he said, you know, he's got two years of learning the system, much like Johnny did. And both of those guys, have, being in the offense for the second year, have a further understanding and can operate at a different speed. Jokel moving around, creating a throwing lane, and it's juggled and then pulled in for a first down inside the 25 by Sabian Holmes. It's a 14 yard pickup. And great job of Jokel just sliding in the pocket. He's not going to get outside the pocket, just slide and find the open receiver. Trey Williams with a big lane. Slips one tackle and grabbed to the ankles at the 12 by Bryce Callahan. 11 yards there. Anaheim look, Anaheim looking to go 14 here before intermission. Averaging eight yards per play on this drive so far. Jokel. Passes low, but caught inside the 10 at the eight yard line by Kennedy. That's a gain of three. And we've got a stoppage of play with an injured Bryce Owl, James Radcliffe, starting linebacker. Now, Rice has struggled on defense the last few series. Tom, anything in particular you're noticing down there as to the reason why? Well, guys, I think they're just winded right now. These sustained drives that we've seen from AM, you got a lot of hands on the hips from the defensive front for Rice. And to be honest with you, not only are they get not being able to get off of blocks in the run game, it's totally neutralizing any chance they have of getting a pass rush. You got 240 pound defensive ends getting leaned on by 325 pound <laughs> tackles. Well, that's that was the concern for David Bailiff coming in was the size differential between this offensive line and his defensive line. And then when it gets hot and they get tired, it's difficult to stop them. They'll run it here to Molina. Stood up inside the five short of the first down. So it'll be a third down coming. A must stop here, really for Rice, knowing what lies ahead after halftime. Well, you come in with some of the new offensive linemen, as you mentioned, a new center in Mike Matthews, but a new right guard in Jermaine Effetti. He's 330 pounds, so they've added some beef up front that hopefully uh, they're looking to employ in the SEC. Here's Williams, and he's close to the first down at the one-yard line. Alex Lyons on the tackle. Let's see where they spot it. I think no matter first down or not, they're going to go for this one if they come up short. You can go out and get it back like Trey Carson. And you've got returning offensive linemen like Jake Matthews and Jarvis Harrison and Abu. There's some beef up front. Against this team, you've got to start to establish your identity and your ability to convert in these kinds of situations. Fourth down and one to get the first down. About a yard and a half to get the touchdown. Here's Carson, dives, touchdown! Two touchdowns in Trey Carson's Aggie debut after transferring from Oregon. That's the exact same play that Carson scored on earlier in the game 
play that we haven't seen a whole lot a year ago from Texas A&M. A straight power play. Impressive drive by A&M. And Bertolette gives A&M a two touchdown lead late in the second quarter. Three unanswered scoring drives in a row for the Aggies. One of the new additions for this A&M offense is their new tight end, six foot six, 270 pounds, Cameron Clear. Here he is. He's just going to come down and block and seal off on the power, and that gives Trey Carson, Nehemiah Hicks, the other tight end, the opportunity. Big hole there. But Cameron Clear is the guy to keep an eye on this season. Big guy, able to block, as you saw, but he also can run. He can get downfield in the passing game. He can line up as a wide receiver. He is a joker in this offense that can line up anywhere and be a factor. No, guys, this offense really started to gel the first couple of minutes of the second quarter. You started to see the offensive line take, start to take effect. You saw confidence in Matt Jokel. And you know what? Matt Jokel might have struggled a couple of plays early on in the first couple of series, but he's taken darn good care of this offense, and he's avoided two things, turnovers and taking disastrous negative plays that lead to third and long. And, and guys, what this does for Kevin Sumlin, it gives him confidence that, okay, if Johnny Manziel gets hurt, at least now Jokel has played. He's been in an adverse situation where his team trailed, and he's produced. Well, and you know what kinds of plays he likes in game situation, right? He's not going to be the same player as Johnny Manziel, but Johnny Manziel playing in the SEC, it's going to be very difficult to stay healthy throughout the course of this season with the way he plays. You need an experienced backup. And you know what? They can accentuate his strengths, mask his weaknesses, without having to abandon their offensive philosophy. He's been solid. 14 of 19 passing, 190 yards at a touchdown. They're not playing an SEC defense, but he's look good. Bertolette with a deep kickoff, and it will come out to the 25. Let's say hello again to Reese in the studio. Dave, the first Lexus halftime report of this first college football Saturday is on the way, and we're going to spend a little time talking about the arrival of Johnny Menzel, who's coming in the second half. Mark and Lou will tell you what they think the impact in the second half will be. Plenty of highlights going on. Ohio State struggling more than it ought to be with Buffalo right now. And they just got a huge break. Florida's offense doesn't look very good either. And we'll also look ahead to the Georgia-Clemson game on ABC tonight. It's all coming up on the Lexus Halftime Report. And Reese, I'm sure Mark and Lou much cooler and drier than they were <laughs> when they were with Brian. South Carolina on the field. Terrell, I'm still sweating it out here in Texas. Charles Ross making Aggie coaches sweat with the way he's run through their defense. Man, another power run. 13 yards for Charles Ross. Can AM go in with a two touchdown lead, or can Rice get some momentum back and get some points? If I'm Rice, I'm continuing to hand the ball to Ross on the interior. There's still a three man. Defensive line, great look to run the football. Just because there's three minutes and change left, don't treat it like a two-minute drill. Give the ball to Ross. Out in the flat, Mario Hall gets a block, and Hall banged out a play at midfield. It Dante Moore out there blocking. It's a first down for Rice. Yeah, but they will get the ball to start the second half after AM started the game on offense. David Bailiff, seventh-year head coach. When uh, Kevin Sumlin was at Houston, the two were neighbors. Became pretty good friends. Bailiff's kids would go over to his front yard and stick plastic owls in someone's yard before the game. <laughs> they had a good laugh about it. McCard with a fade. Ow, oh, it's caught! What a grab by Taylor at six feet five. It looked initially like it was going to be overthrown. There is a flag down, though. Let's see if he gets his foot down, has possession. Oh, yeah. Yes. But again, a penalty marker down. It appears it's coming back. In eligible receiver downfield, number 79 offense. Five-yard penalty to keep first out. Boy, that's a big mistake. Well, he gets a screen pass, and Hody downfield? Well, yeah, I mean, that was a quick throw. I don't know how Hody got downfield so fast. You'll see him. He's at the top of the screen up here. Let's take a look. Oh, that's, I don't, I don't agree with that call. He just went downfield two or three yards, but that's not downfield. 
So it negates a 15 yard gain. I got Dreyfus Jackson in that quarterback here. Sophomore from Cedar Hill, Texas, who started a game last year. He'll keep it. Makes one man miss, then gets plowed at the 48 yard line by true freshman Deshaun Hall, who they think has a bright future here at AM. 6'6, 250 pound defensive end. I'm not quite sure why you put Dreyfus Jackson in the game in this scenario in a two minute drill, which Taylor McCard throwing the football is a much better execute. Maybe they want to get the element of the quarterback run in this situation. As McCard was shaken up. Second down and eight. And Jackson will throw. And it's pulled in for a first down by Connor Sella at the 37-yard line. That throw looked a lot better than his throws in warm-ups. <laughs> You're being nice. It was on target. And all intents and purposes, they're in field goal range. Chris Boswell is a strong leg. Has made 11 50-yarders in his career. That won't help his cause, though. Jackson dragged down for a two-yard loss. There's Deshaun Hall again. And this is what they really love about Hall, the ability to play off of the block, play the quarterback, and play the running back in that read option scenario. He's got the athletic ability, as you mentioned, very long. When he gets his hands on you at six foot six, hard to get away from him. McCarg is back on the field, clock running. Bryce has one timeout remaining. Second down and 13. Pressure coming, and McCarg hits Jordan Taylor. Tackled inbounds. Short of the first down. Rice will use its final timeout with 32 seconds left. Would be about a 50-yard field goal from here. And there is some wind down there. We've seen the ball blow off the tee several times on kickoffs. With only two races left until the chase for the cup, Jimmy Johnson looks to maintain his lead on the field as the com competition heats up in Atlanta Motor Speedway, the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series, Sunday, 7 on ESPN. Also live on Watch ESPN. And we're 32 seconds away, along with intermission, and then a series by Rice from seeing the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, Johnny Manziel. Be interesting to see, because talking coaches and players about his growth, understanding defenses, arm strength, accuracy, whether it transfers to the game. Yeah, what I want to see, what, what's different? What has he improved on in the offseason? I know he's gone out and got a lot of work, worked with George Whitfield out in California. I mean, he had some habits a year ago that weren't the best when he went to throw the football. He would spin out a little bit, uh, not drive his, his weight from back to front. And from all intents and purposes, what we've heard from practice is he's worked on those things in the pocket, and it'll be interesting to see how he does in the second half. Third down and five for Rice at the 33. The cards throw caught loose inside the 20-yard line, inside the 10 is Jordan Taylor down to the five. Rice out of timeouts, but the clock will stop as they reset the ball. Plenty of time. First and goal for the Owls. And the card will spike it. 23 seconds left in the half. Now how do you handle this here? If you're the Rice offense, you run the ball well, do you take a chance there or just throws to the end zone? No, I think, you know, the guy that's hot is Taylor, the wide receiver. Jordan Taylor's made a bunch of plays in this first half. He beat Damian Jacobs, the corner, uh, on that last play. And now he's lined up down here, looks like, in one-on-one. -on -one. Take a shot. Throw the fade, six feet five. Already did it once at work. Then McCard going the other way, and that pass too long for the intended receiver, Mario Hull. So now it is third down and goal. It's always a danger when you spike it on first down, you waste it down. They're already up there lined up. It yeah. takes a few more seconds to throw the ball, right? Well, you'd like, the, in an ideal scenario, you'd like to snap the ball and take a shot. And a lot of teams, it's all about preparation. Have you practiced that situation? Do you have a play that you go to automatically? And clearly, Rice did, and they had to spike it. Third down and goal for Rice. 18 seconds left in a half. McCarg end zone broken up and caught. Touchdown, Jordan Taylor. Wow. Tony Hurd at five feet nine batted it in the air, and then the six feet five inch Jordan Taylor snatched it and scored. 
Jordan Taylor is just a ball player. He is not intimidated by this environment. He is not intimidated by the Aggies. He has made play after play, and that time, he said, you're not going to throw me the football? Fine, I'll just go take it from you and score. And the extra point, good. How about that by Rice? It looked like they're done, and they come back with an impressive drive to cut the Rice lead, or the a and lead, rather, to seven before Johnny football comes in. Well, right here, it's just who wants it more? And Hurd jumped a little bit too soon, and Taylor just came in and, like a basketball player, took that ball away from him. You got to see Hurd jumps a little too soon, and then it's coming down, and Taylor's able to get that football and get it in the end zone. If you would have told Rice they'd be down by only seven points at halftime on the road the first game of the year, I think they would take it all day long, and a little bit of momentum going uh, into uh, halftime and that play certainly is going to be uh, one of the candidates for the Sports Center top 10. Second touchdown pass for McCarg. Doesn't the script set up nicely for the second half where Johnny Manziel can come in to the rescue, so to speak? They're leading, but it's only seven and their defense has struggled. We'll see if him taking the field that that energizes the other side of the ball. Well, all the talk coming into this game was, you know, Johnny Menzel is only going to play one half anyway, whether it's the first half or the second half. Or all of a sudden, they need Johnny Menzel in the second half. And we thought, hey, if it's a blowout, maybe he only plays the third quarter, and we'll see what happens in the third quarter. Remember, he only has six quarters until the Alabama game, so they do want to get him as many game reps as possible with his offensive line and his new receivers. Gonzalez is the deep man along with Ben Molina for Texas A&M. Ten seconds remaining until intermission. Here's Molina. Up to the 29-yard line. Ball out. The ball is fumbled. Rice has it with four seconds on the clock. They've got time to kick a field goal. Pat jumped on it for Rice. And the Owls will have a crack at three points. Looked like Molina was fighting for extra yardage. It's hard to see from that angle. I'm sure we'll take another look. Fighting, fighting. Does his knee go down? Alex Francis knocked it free. It's under further review. Now to look at it. You got to be able to see the ball when the player is going to the ground. Ball is still in. No, oh, that it's ball out. is out. Before the elbow goes down, that ball came out. Punched out by the defender. Great play. And what an opportunity, golden opportunity for Rice. Roderick Jackson was the man that forced the fumble. And Zach Pat with the recovery. See right there, no, there's no, nothing touching the ground other than his hand, and that ball is out. So now you're looking at a 45, 46-yard field After goal for Chris review, Boswell. Moving on the field is confirmed. First down, right. Boswell has 11 career field goals of 50 yards or more. That's the most yeah. of active kickers. It's inside 50. He's got a huge leg. There's not a question of uh, length here. It's just a question of uh, accuracy. Imagine they can steal three points after that touchdown. The momentum they'll have going into intermission. 45-yard attempt. And this one is wide to the right. So unable to capitalize on the turnover. And Johnny Football says, I'm getting in the locker room and getting mentally prepared to play in the second half. 28-21. AM on top. Here's Tom. Coach, obviously off to a slow start offensively, but got into gear to start the second quarter. Assess uh, Matt Jokel's performance to this point. No, I think he's operated the offense fine. You know, we, we didn't score in the first series, but uh, we've been pretty efficient after that. Uh, offensively, that's not the issue. Matt's playing well. Our line's playing well. Uh, we just got to get some stops on defense. What type of adjustments can we expect to see on defense? Well, you know, we, we're going to make some adjustments. We got a bunch of young guys out there that, uh, you know, have been forced to play because of different circumstances. So, 
uh, you know, we, we got to get them in the right position. Uh, we're playing a veteran ball team, and, and uh, we'll get them settled down, and we just got to get some stops on defense, and we'll be fine. We expect to make a different a change at quarterback? Yeah, I think so. I think <laughs> uh, I think we'll play it. But Matt's played well. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, that hasn't been the issue. Uh, you know, we, we just got to get off the field on defense. Thanks, Coach. All right. Over to Mark Schwartz with David Bailiff. All right, Tom, a game of momentum swings, and it swung at the end toward David Bailiff and the Rice team. What would you think of the way your team finished the half after being down two touchdowns? Well, you know, I love the way we finished. I wish we'd have kicked that field goal through at the end there. Got those points. Really pleased how we started this football game. Offensively had the 96-yard drive to start the season. Got a little unfocused. We're getting this halftime, and we know we got a big-time half of football coming right at us with Johnny Manziel going to step on this field. How do you prepare for that? You know what? We just got to keep playing with great effort. We got to keep having fun, and, you know, we got to get some breaks and get some turnovers, but we're looking forward to a great half of football. All right, Coach. Dave, back up to you. Thanks, All right, Mark. And David Bailiff has to be pleased with just a seven-point deficit, 28-21. A&M on top. Now to Reese, Mark, and Lou in the studio. This is College Football on ESPN, presented by Cars.com. It's a College football is back, and so is Johnny Manziel. He will start the second half at quarterback as we welcome you back to the SEC on ESPN. And they need him. They only have a seven-point lead over Rice at halftime, 28-21. Back with Brian Greasy. I'm Dave Pash. So the suspension that many around college football felt was just a joke is now history and Johnny Manziel is a college football player again what do you expect here in the well, second I, I expect everything that we've heard about in practice is that he's been focused that he has improved his footwork that he's been working from the pocket more that his arm strength has gotten better and been more vocal and really been able to lead this offense in even a faster pace I expect to see all those things in the second half the most exciting player in college football the most polarizing player in college football and all the events of the offseason that he's been looking forward to putting behind him and just focusing on playing in games. That starts shortly. Rice will get the ball first here in the second half. And I think we all understand and know the fire that burns within John Manziel. And I, and I think that that fire is burning even hotter with everything that's been happening with all the naysayers that have jumped off the bandwagon. This will be his first opportunity to say something on the field about it. Total of eight players suspended for AM. Six are now eligible to Shazer Everett, along with Manziel, suspended for the first half only today. It'll come out to the 25 for Rice. Here's Tom. Well, guys, Johnny Manziel came out here and warmed up, and he had a hop in his step and a live arm. He's throwing 100 miles an hour, a keen eye. He's ready to go. You can tell he's been itching and scratching. He's back in his jungle. And you know what? So much of his impulsiveness and those traits that he had that can get him on uh, in trouble off the field are so much of what make him great on it. We should see a bulk of that here in the next two quarters. But again, he'll have to wait. Rice's offense outgained Texas A&M in the first half. 332 yards of offense. And again, A&M with a handful of suspended players on defense hasn't helped. But a bad snap here. McHart chases it down and picks it up and throws it away. They've been having all kinds of trouble with the snap, with some mental errors, guys not lined up correctly. McHarg wasn't looking here when the snap came from Nate Richards. Well, it's a smart play right here by McHarg not to do something catastrophic. Get outside the pocket. That was important. If he would have stayed inside the pocket, that would have been a grounding penalty. But he had the presence of mind not to panic, get outside the pocket, and throw it away. McHarg was solid in the first half, threw for 152 yards and a couple of touchdowns. Also ran for 74 yards. Second and 10. McHart with time. And that one's overthrown. Trying for Jordan Taylor. So it'll be third down and 10. He had to Shazer Everett there in coverage. 
for Texas A&M. They're glad to have him back. Yeah, and the first play, uh, first series back for the Shazer Everett after having to sit out the first uh, half. They need him on Jordan Taylor because Jordan Taylor's had his way with this uh, secondary in the first half. Guard with time on third and ten, and it is intercepted at the 40-yard line by Tremaine Jacobs, and Johnny Football is back. snap of 2013 and it'll be a pass play and Manziel takes off there goes Johnny football first down to the 29 yard line that's why they love him here in College Station so much adrenaline pumping through Johnny Manziel I didn't think he was going to throw that football he was just looking for somewhere to escape and be who he is Manziel taking off again. Trying to get outside. And dives to the 21. About eight yards there for Manziel, who last year rushed for over 1,400. Number two all-time on SEC quarterbacks behind Cam Newton. First freshman Heisman Trophy winner, trying to become only the second to win two Heismans. Archie Griffin did it in the mid-70s. Manziel, going to fire to the end zone. And that pass off the mark intended for Darrell Walker. Manziel was very accurate last year, around 70% completion rate. Well, one of the questions coming in is, do they want him to run the football as much as he did a year ago? Average 17, 18 rushes a game, and in the SEC, you take the risk of getting injured with that many. They brought in some backs to support him, but certainly right off the bat, he wants to run. We're going to convert here on third down and three. In trouble, trying to escape, but can't wrestle down by Michael Cutzler at the 27-yard line, which will force a long field goal try here. That's the first sack for either team. That interception by Rice was the first turnover by the Owls. On that time, they got a little bit of contain, kept Manziel in the pocket, and then Cutzler came free. Early, we haven't seen at least a lot of a lot of adrenaline, but we haven't seen Manziel comfortable in that pocket. 44-yard attempt for Taylor Bertolette, who missed nine field goal tries last year. Snap high, but it's down, and the kick is gone. So Johnny Manziel and Texas A&M get three points off the Rice turnover and extend their lead to 10. Our first half stats brought to you by America's Navy. We mentioned Rice outgained Texas A&M. No turnovers, but on the opening possession of the second half, the Owls throw an interception. And then Johnny Manziel takes the field. And they get a field goal. 44 yards for Taylor Bertolet. Eddington and Hull are deep for Rice. And Bertolet with a deep kick. They will come out of the 25 for the Owls. We'll see how they respond after a giveaway on their first possession. What did you think of Manziel's opening series? Well, I think there's so much adrenaline running through his body right now. You know, he's never come off the bench. That's a whole new experience for him. And with everything that's gone on, just to get out there and get a little sweat in and, and move the team down and get a field goal, I thought it was a, a good start for him. But certainly, we're going to see as the game goes on how well has he developed as a quarterback in the pocket. 
on just how much he can settle down that fine line between being disciplined and not losing that freewheeling edge that makes him great. It's Tom Logan Bill down on the field. He'll be with us throughout the season. Dave Pash, Brian Greasy up here in the booth. Early third quarter, and m by 10. McCard trying to shake off an interception, hands it off to Ross. And he is stacked up, but still able to splatter the pile and get to the 30-yard line for five yards. This has been an impressive day for Ross. He's only carried it seven times, but 66 yards and a touchdown. He also has a receiving score. That was his eighth attempt on the ground, now 71 yards. So second and five. See how Rice handles the emotion of uh, the crowd here with Manziel now eligible as again Ross drags defenders with him to the 37 yard line for a first down. Well, we're going to see how this Texas A&M defense responds. They really were the weak link in the first half. Not up to the challenge of the Rice offense and without six of their starters in this game they're going to find out a lot about some of their reserves and I think what they found out is that not quite ready for big time football yet. First down for Rice on its 37 yard line. 15 straight losses for Rice against AM. Their last win against the Aggies, 1980. Old Southwest Conference goes. This time they get Ross. Takes seven guys to get him to the ground at the 35. It's a loss of two. Julian Obioha in there and DeShazer Everett, who was suspended for the first half, but is back out there now at corner. Came in and run support. Well, Ross is 235 pounds, so he's he's no small back. He's 6'1, he's compact, he drives his legs. We've seen time and time again with his goal line or show yardage, but he gets the extra two or three yards after contact. Second and 12 at the Rice 35. McCart pulls it back, and his pass is high and intercepted by Clay Honeycutt. Consecutive picks for AM. Honeycutt somersaults to the 34. Looked like Donnie Baggs, the linebacker, got in the throwing lane, and that's why McCarg had to throw this ball high. Take a look. Here's Donnie Baggs. He's going to be right in the lane that McCarg wants to throw, so he throws it a little bit high over the wide receiver right to Honeycutt. An easy play and another turnover on consecutive series for Rice. And so Johnny Manziel and the offense start at the Rice 34. Manziel will have Trey Carson next to him. Carson had two touchdowns in the first half. Here's Carson. Off left guard inside the 30 for seven yards. Nick Elder on the tackle. We've seen, we've seen pretty even carries between Carson and Molina. Here's Carson again. He'll lose yardage this time as the left guard Jarvis Harrison got beat by Christian Covington. A loss of most of four on the play. Covington, watch him on the left side of your screen, just comes off and gets the arm underneath. And you can't take this, this defense for Rice lightly. They have played hard in this game. So a third down and seven. On the 31. Manziel staying in the pocket for now. Now he takes off. Takes a shot but gets the first down. Nick Elder with the hit. But it's an eight-yard game. And a good decision. It wasn't, uh, he didn't run out of the pocket too soon. Stayed in there, surveyed the field downfield, and nothing was there. And he did take a shot and then got into a little sparring match with one of the defensive linemen for Rice. Hasn't lost that fire. No. <laughs> Don't think he ever will. Manziel fires, caught inside the 10 yard line. Evans able to keep his balance. Touchdown, a and Manziel's first of 2013. Only 46 more to go to match last year's total for Johnny Manziel. Touchdowns responsible for. Led the country in that category last year. Uh, he picks right up where he left off with Mike Evans. Evans has made two or three big plays in this game. 
can see a lot of him and Ricky Seals Jones on the receiving end of Johnny Manziel this year. Birdlet puts it through. 38-21 AM. If you're going to talk trash to the defense, especially defensive line, you better follow it up. And that's exactly what Manziel did. Pump one way, come back with the underneath route. And Mike Evans does the rest. Welcome back, number two in College Station. This is Dick Sporting Goods Kickoff Week. Welcome back to College Station. One of the things we wondered about Johnny Manziel was his development in the pocket, reading defenses. Take a look here. He's going to move the linebacker with his vision to the left. Opens up the middle of the field to where he ultimately wanted to get the ball to Mike Evans. Here he comes. Here's number two in the progression, and here's number three, and he hits him in stride for the touchdown. The discipline of moving a linebacker with your eyes is something Johnny Manziel didn't do a whole lot of last year, showing some signs of growth in the offseason coming into this season. Paul will take a knee. It will come out to the 25 for Rice. Here's Tom with more. You know, and I really think it's a concerted effort for him. As I mentioned earlier, there's that fine line between losing that dynamic element that you bring with your legs and flushing out of the pocket and being disciplined and patient enough to work through things. With young quarterbacks, when they get flushed or they get pressure, their eyes come down and they immediately want to escape. He could have done that right there. He chose not to. We're really seeing some growth there in the past game, and he settled down from that first series. Didn't hurt that on consecutive possessions, he gets a short field starting... <laughs> In Rice territory after back to back picks. The Cardinal handed off to Ross. Bounces off the defender, keeps going. Ross finally brought down after an 11 yard pickup at the 36 by Howard Matthew. And I think here's a look at the progression, right? You look at the one side of the field, you pump, check the linebacker, get backside to your second and third re outlets, and there's a lot of meat on that bone on the backside. You got to get through your progression sometimes as a quarterback. Last year, Manziel was one progression and then run, and that was a different uh, scenario. Ross able to reach the 40 for about five more yards. No, and Brian Clarence McKinney, the offensive coordinator, did a nice job helping him out with scheme, too, by influencing linebacker flow to that side with the flare route as Johnny Manziel's looking left and then working back opens up those lanes a little wider for him. Pass out into the flat that's pulled in by Hall and shoved out of bounds by Tremaine Jacobs just short of the first down. And at the end of the day, I think the most impressive thing or the smartest thing that's happened in the offseason with Clarence McKinney and Johnny Manziel is starting to anticipate how defenses will play him. They're not going to let him get outside the pocket, so you better learn how to play from the pocket. Here's Ross on the pitch. And he's able to get the first down, or is he? Stepped out, they say, at the 45. Looked like initially he was past the marker when he stepped out, but... The linesman says right at the 45, so we'll see if measurement is necessary here. Nope, fourth down. And you have to go if you're Rice, right? You don't have to, no. You want to kick it back to Manziel? <laughs> or, or try I to think get it they will. I mean, if I have Ross, I'm going for it too. And McCarg on the quarterback, Snape, appears to have enough. How about just on that throw, the mechanics? of Manziel when you watched him complete that, that yeah, touchdown it's, pass. It's a small sample so far. That's a short route. I, when he goes to throw the football down the field and drive it into a seam, I really want to see uh, how he's progressed. He had a, a habit a year ago of spinning out sometimes on his left leg. I'd love to see him drive that ball down the field. He's got plenty of arm strength, and I think uh, from what we've heard from Kevin Sumlin and some of the teammates that uh, his arm strength has gotten better because his legs have gotten better and his efficiency in the pocket. The card hits Jordan Taylor and he gets nailed by DeShazer Everett. No gain on the play. Pass complete to number 15. Jordan Rice has been resilient so far in the game. Does it have another response in it with uh, the emotional tide turning because of Johnny Manziel's appearance? His presence lifted this crowd as well. McCargan second and ten. An open man, and the knee was down on the catch. Dante Moore 
could not keep his knee off the turf. So it's a gain of only five. Third and five coming up. I'm tailing the car. I'm finding where Jordan Taylor is, and I'm taking my chances with him. At the top of the screen, one-on-one -on -one with the Cesar Everett, but he's been the most consistent player on offense for Rice, and I'd give him the football. Here comes pressure up the middle. It's picked up. McCart throws incomplete. Dante Moore, the intended receiver. Tremaine Jacobs was there to greet the football as it arrived and knock it down. It's fourth and five, and Rice will punt. Well, this defense has played better in the second half, and Jacobs breaks on it. Great job playing through the defender, not getting there too early. But once that ball gets there, getting your mitts inside and getting that football out. Labhart is the deep man for Rice, and another punt that sails over his head and into the end zone. It will come out to the 20 for Johnny Manziel. Already accounted for a passing touchdown. It's a 17-point lead. Last season, Johnny Manziel against LSU had some issues with his footwork. Take a look here. You see his feet are parallel to the line of scrimmage, falling backwards, trying to throw downfield. That's a recipe for disaster. Can't get anything on the football. Take a look now. In this game, a little bit more concerted effort. His feet are parallel to the receiver, so driving that football on that last touchdown pass. Efficiency in the pocket with the feet is so important for a quarterback, and if you've never been coached on that, it's hard to just innately do it. He's had a lot of help this season, this offseason, from George Whitfield, the quarterback coach, out in California, and you can see already the difference that it's made in Johnny Menzel, efficient with efficiency in the pocket. And, and how hard is it to go as a retro freshman from Cliff Kingsbury to all of a sudden a guy who wasn't on the staff last year coming in, Jake Spavadol. As Manziel will throw here on first down, running around, firing off his back foot there. Incomplete intended for Malcolm Kennedy. You know, so much a quality quarterback play, it starts from the ground up. Everybody wants to focus on height, their arm strength, so on and so forth. But it's about feet and balance and the transfer of weight through your hips and driving off your back foot and all the sorts of things, even your off shoulder, your non-throwing shoulder, that lend to accuracy, which is the fundamental essence of the position. Manziel with a short throw here on second and ten to freshman Jeremy Taboyo. And he's out of play and after a gain of about three yards and I and I gotta say Johnny Manziel does so many things well right I mean he is the most dynamic player in college football and the fact that he has been focused this offseason with everything going on and he's improved and worked on these things that are important to playing quarterback and to him personally getting better that's impressive I think that's what his teammates see oh he gets swallowed here by Christian Covington that's twice Covington has been in the backfield Manziel down at the 15 and A&M has to punt. Jake Matthews, the yeah. All-American left tackle? He did beat Matthews. You'll see they just had a TE stunt, which means the tackle comes first and the end comes second. And between Jake Matthews and Jarvis Harrison, both returning starters, they weren't able to pass that off. And I, I chalked that up to a little bit of newness in the season and not being on the same page in communication on that, that simple stunt. There's a booming kick by Drew Kayser. Look at the length of the field. On one hop, Callahan takes it and does well to get back near the 20-yard line. ESPN College Football, brought to you by Dick's Sporting Goods. Every season starts at Dick's. And Best Buy. Triple digits, humid, and greasy's changed shirts three times, but <laughs> nothing's going to stop these fans here at College Station from watching Johnny Football, who's back, got a touchdown pass, he's been sacked twice, his team up 17, and Dreyfus Jackson in the quarterback for the out. First down, they're 19, a 77-yard punt. Derek Dillard on the carry gets near the 23 for about four yards. 
Guys, I just talked to defensive coordinator Mark Snyder on the Texas A&M sideline, and I asked him point blank, why sets the heavy dose of the three-man front? He said, when we get in four-man front, they know exactly what they're getting. We're trying to create that, create some confusion up front, create confusion for the quarterback. It's a high-risk, high-reward proposition, but we're willing to do it. And the De Shazer Everett back is huge for them on the perimeter. They've given up 200 rushing yards to Rice. Second and six for Jackson, who's replacing the card. Don't know again if that's injury. Or they think Jackson gives him a better shot here after the two picks. No running room this time for Charles Ross. A rare stop for AM against him. That's Donnie Baggs, the middle linebacker. Well, and, and all the attention has been on Johnny Manziel, but let's be let's be honest. If the season for Texas AM is gonna bank on this defense and how well they're able to stop offenses and so many new players. Uh, that's going to be the big question mark for AM this season. Check that. It was Dillard on the carry. He's still in on third down and four for Rice. That is 25 yard line. Jackson flushed out of the pocket, being chased. And Jackson slips a tackle, picks up the first down. Up near the 40 yard line, where Nate Askew finally tracks him down. Nate. 12 yards on the play. Well, they talked about speed being the calling card of this AM defense, and that time Donnie Baggs nor uh, Mastro Giovanni are able to keep up with the speed of Jackson and big first down. Here's Dillard, and Dillard oh, runs right into Howard Matthews. An eight yard pickup to the 45 yard line. Howard Matthews having a tough day. He's been hit twice hard. Although this guy's 190, the guy that hit him earlier is 235. That's what he's going to see, though, in the SEC. I mean, you, you have backs coming through, Todd Gurley, and backs like that that are big, physical backs. And when you're a safety and you play in that league, you better be 215 pounds. Matthews listed at 200, started five games as a sophomore last year. Six new starters on this defense for AM. Dillard able to keep his feet, get the first down, still going. They finally wrap him up at the 43-yard line, but Rice continues to pound it right at the Aggie defense and have success doing it. Alonzo Williams is wearing number 90 today, normally number 83, but that number 90, you see no name in the back of the jersey. A defensive player, a different player, is going to wear that each week to honor the wretched freshman Aggie who died in a car accident in the offseason, Polo Manakayanu. They're also wearing decals on their helmets to honor the late young man. First time this half, Rice has been in enemy territory. Jackson a little trouble with a handle there, so he'll take off. Nifty move at the 42, and he makes it to the 37, seven-yard gain. It's a change up here, obviously, for Rice on offense, putting Jackson in, I think. John Reagan, the offensive coordinator, felt like the offense was getting a little bit stale, bring in a different look, and keep this a and defense off, off guard. Jackson started once last year and came off the bench to win their bowl game. Six touchdowns a year ago with no interceptions. Derek Dillard stays in the game at running back. All running play so far in this drive. And now Jackson looking to throw in trouble being chased. And he gets rid of the pass incomplete. Trying to hit Jordan Taylor, who was entangled with DeShazer Everett. Jackson did well to get out of trouble there. So it is third down and four. If you're Rice, are you in a situation here where you're, you're four down territory? Yeah, absolutely. Now that you're under three minutes left in the third quarter and down 17, you've got to get points on this drive. Ball on the AM 38. Rice around 50% third down conversion rate so far. They'll hand it off to Diller, who hammers his way for a first down to the 33 yard line. And that's just a, that's a killer for a defense on third and three and a half to four yards and you can just hand the ball inside and get a first down that easily that is not a recipe for success on defense hardrick walker true freshman who started the game today because kirby ennis the normal 
starting defensive tackle suspended for a game arrested in February on weapons charges. Hopefully he's all right. Saturday night football on ABC kickoff under the lights in Death Valley. It's Aaron Murray and Georgia against Taj Boyd and Clemson. Saturday night football presented by Windows tonight, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ABC. Let's go back to the studio and check in with Reese Davis. All right, guys, live mass moment. Brought to you by Taco Bell and Paul. I tell you, Dana Holgerson is probably glad that, that he's living a moment. William and Mary against West Virginia. Michael Graham went in for the score, and the Tribe, Sands Headgear, had the lead. And then in a 17-17 game, look, this is deep in the fourth quarter. Wendell Smallwood goes in, and the Holgersons escape 24-17. Now West Virginia lost some uh, key players off that offense. Tavon Austin, Geno Smith, and their quarterbacks coach, Jake Spavadol, yep. who's the new mentor for Johnny Manziel at age 28. Yeah, and that's a big loss. I mean, it's uh, when you have a new coach uh, that you comes in, I think Johnny needed somebody that had a pedigree and a resume, which Spavadol obviously does, working with guys like Case Keenum and Brandon Whedon. Uh, and Geno Smith, but you also needed somebody young enough that could relate to Manziel, and I think that Kevin Sumlin found the perfect guy in Jake Spavler. He was a graduate assistant when Sumlin was a head coach in Houston. He was there with him. On first and ten off play action, Jackson has a man wide open, but throws it way over his head. Intended for Connor Sella. Now a chance that a big play goes by the board, and now Sella shaken up on the play. our first cramp it looks like of the game we've seen this in all the games that have been played this first week and it's just so hot it's almost impossible to get enough fluids in your body to prevent cramping and whether it's the daytime or nighttime doesn't matter 97 feels like 101 <laughs> felt like 120 for you the other oh. night at South Carolina what did you make of some of the comments by the way about Jadavian Clowney you know, I was I was there to, to watch the game from the sideline, and, and it, it was so hot. I mean, it's almost impossible with the way that offenses play so up tempo. And, and North Carolina came in with a game plan to go up tempo and try to tire out that defensive line. You can't rush a quarterback 60, 70 times in a game and not get tired. Now, certainly Clowney needs to be in better shape. I believe that, uh, but I think a little bit of that criticism was unfair. Second and ten for Rice. And him showing blitz. Run play, Dillard grab from behind and brought down at the 31. It's a three-yard game. You know, guys, with Jadavion Clowney, with his height and his long arms, if he gets tired, he plays high. And the higher he plays, the easier it is for offenses to take advantage of him, especially in the run game. And as you mentioned, Brian, that's what took place the other night. He does have to get into better shape, but, boy, with offenses today, that's a long four quarters for a defensive lineman. Third and nine for Rice. From here would be about a 50-yard field goal. Chris Boswell has the leg. Missed a 45-yarder at the end of the first half. Jackson in trouble again, being chased. Throws complete. A big hit by Tremaine Jacobs on Dante Moore. And he appears to be short of the first down based on the spot. Fourth and one. Looks like they're going to go for it here. They crowd the line of scrimmage, and now Jackson backs off here. I don't kick the field ball and, and get some points here. Cut it to, to 14. You still got a quarter to play. Fairmont missed early in the first half. Maybe they don't have confidence he can make it. And Jackson, oh, kept his balance. Oh, what a play by Jackson. And now a flag comes in after Jackson gets inside the five and is grabbed by Tony Hurd. Looked like he... Went down at first and then popped right up and kept running. Great job to put his left hand down and maintain his footing. Yeah, Isaiah Golden, the freshman defensive tackle, got Personal penetration. Foul. Face mask for the defense. Half the distance to the goal, automatic first down. But Jackson with great effort and tack on an extra three or four yards, and now all of a sudden, right inside the five. 
Closing seconds of the third quarter. Price trying to make it a 10-point game. Ball on the two. First and goal. 13th play of the drive for the Owls. Play clock at three. Jackson hands it off. And Dillard close to the goal line, but down inside the one. What an impressive drive now. 14 plays in, and first time that drives with Jackson has had an opportunity to play in this game and takes him right down the field. And a chance to cut it to a 10-point deficit when we start the fourth quarter here in College Station. Celebrating its ninth year sponsoring the Good Hands Field Goal Nets, Allstate makes contributions to participating universities' general scholarship funds for each field goal and extra point kick. To date, Allstate has contributed more than $3 million in scholarship money. Second and goal for Rice at the Texas A&M 1. Backup quarterback Dreyfus Jackson and Charles Ross in the backfield for the Owls. Both teams have had success in the red zone. is in touchdown rice the third touchdown today for charles ross two rushing one receiving a heck of a day for the senior from shirts texas and that was easy the, the players were there for AM. they just got pushed back they were in their gaps they just got overpowered and, and maybe they're getting tired starting to stand up and and this rice offensive line is pushing them off the ball think about it rice basically gave AM points twice with the turnovers deep in their own territory they did hold AM to a field goal the first time and then johnny manzel hit evans for a touchdown after the second interception 14 play drive there's some movement point after is good let's see what the flag is Offsides, defense 29, penalties decline, point is good. Well, it's nothing new with this defensive all, all game. I think Rice has taken over at the line of scrimmage. Take a look at some of these running plays. You got offensive linemen getting to the second level and getting on linebackers, creating holes for these running backs. You got two, two guys in one gap for Texas A&M. Donnie Bags in a gap, gets blocked big holes on the inside and then you get some great blocks on the second level Nate Richards the center for Rice gets the block on bags if A&M is going to compete in the SEC and everybody's talking about them as a national championship contender this defense has got to improve so many young players and Kevin Sumlin knows with 32 true freshmen coming in he's going to have to depend on some of those young guys on this defense to play and learn fast now if you just are tuning in we told you right before kickoff we knew Johnny Manziel was suspended for a half and DeShazer Everett as well, but there are a handful of more players suspended for two games. That includes Gavin Stansberry, a starter on the defensive line, Stephen Jenkins, a starting linebacker, Devontae Harris, a starting corner, and they were already without Kirby Ennis, who was suspended for today's game. Right. But even with those guys, I think they're going to have to play some of these young players, and, and they've got to grow up. And the unfortunate thing for AM, at least defensively, is they only have two weeks before they see... The, the sleds coming in as <laughs> an offensive line for Alabama. Those guys are a little bit different in the way they looked in this Rice offensive line. Scores 38-28 after the main point after. And Gonzalez decides to take it out. And that was not smart. Brought down shy of the 10 yard line by Derek Brown. You know, as disconcerting as it can be to, to have poor gap, you know, recognition and being in the right place at the right time, I think almost 
just as disconcerting is the lack of tackling because we've also seen that today. And in today's landscape of college football, it's hard to practice tackling. It's hard to instill that toughness day in and day out and keep your team healthy. Mark Snyder, the defensive coordinator, uh, they are not going to be happy with the lack of tackling, particularly within the box, when they watch this tape tomorrow. It's in Johnny Football's hands now. Let's see what the offense can do as they run it right up the gut with Trey Carson, and he gets about eight yards, just hammering between the tackles to the 15-yard line. Second and short coming up as they hustle to the line. It's Carson again. First down and more. Up near the 38-yard line. Huge run for the transfer from Oregon, about 23 on that play. But you see the difference between Matt Jokel and Johnny Manziel is not just in their ability to run, but they open up the inside running game with just the threat of getting outside. Manziel running around in the pocket, gets a block, and then gets walloped at the 41-yard line by Gabe Baker. A gain of about four on the play. You know, for a guy that's only 200 pounds, so far in his college career, he's been able to absorb big hits pretty well. Second and six for Manziel and company. That's Molina in motion, and Manziel with a quick throw. Pulled in by Sabian Holmes right at the first down marker. Brian, we've talked so much today about Johnny Manziel, you know, with maturation process, whether it's feet, whether it's mechanics. But part of that process, too, and you know this, I know this as well, the position is when you do get out of the pocket, knowing when to protect yourself when on the move. I think that's a, something that he still has to take some strides in. Manziel with a ton of time and throws a dart. Malcolm Kennedy is free. They finally get him down inside the 20 at the 17-yard line. That was a frozen road thrown by Johnny Manziel. And that's the arm strength that uh, everybody's been talking about. Stay in the pocket, transfer your weight, throw it on time. And he's got plenty of arm strength when he has the right fundamentals in that pocket. Goes through his progressions. So quickly, AM from inside its 10 is now in the red zone. A dump off pass to Molina. Able to keep his feet. And Molina heading for the end zone. Touchdown, AM. Touchdown number two for Johnny Manziel. You notice a different swagger when he's out there, right? Not just for Johnny, but for everybody else on that offense. They play with a different level of confidence when number two's in there, and that's part of leadership, how you affect all the other guys that are playing with you. Bergelet puts it through. Six play, 93-yard drive in a minute 46. That's what Johnny Manziel does for your offense. Talking there with Jake Spavital, new quarterback coach. Well, Ben Molina did most of the work here. Nice run after the catch for an 18-yard touchdown. You're watching the SEC on ESPN, and it's time for our Discover Game Changer, brought to you by Discover Car. Well, I'll give you one guess on a game changer in this game. This number two, there's no question. He comes into a, a standing ovation from the Aggie faithful and right off the bat on the first drive, uses his legs. You can tell he's got some adrenaline pumping. Gets a big first down and then the second drive connects on a touchdown pass after going through his reads and operating from the pocket. Gets to the hands of Mike Evans and you can see he hasn't just been working on his pocket presence but also his touchdown celebrations in the offseason. If you poll 100 people and ask them who wins the Heisman in 2013, you might get 15 or 20 that say Johnny Manziel because a repeat winner has happened only once in the history of the Heisman Trophy. I think his odds were cut in half after the suspension came, news came down. So, how about you? What's realistic for him? What, is, what are his chances, do you think, to win it again? They're realistic. As realistic as any of the other front runners like Taj Boyd or, uh, or those guys. I, there's no question he should be the front runner. Penalty flag down. Now two more penalty flags come in. Fowler taken down at the 17-yard line. Flag 
long conference when he got three penalty flags down. There's two fouls on the play. Holding on the receiving team. Number 43, that penalty's declined. Holding, kicking team number 22. That foul will be enforced. Half the distance to the goal, first down. All right, let's go to Reese Davis now in the studio. Well, on the subject of Taj Boyd, Brian brought him up briefly. Let's take an innovative look brought to you by AT&T. Boyd and Clemson will take on Georgia tonight. And Boyd, tremendously accurate, over 67% last year. Never more accurate than this fourth and 16 drop in the bucket to Nuke Hopkins against LSU last year. Georgia's got a rebuilt defense. Taj will need to be accurate tonight on ABC. Should be a terrific atmosphere in Death Valley for that game. We've been there when they come running down the hill for day games. We'll be outstanding tonight in that matchup. ACC versus the SEC. Taylor McCarg in the game. The quarterback hands it off to Ross and he is out near the 11-yard line. And I think two of the great stories in college football this year, two fifth-year senior quarterbacks coming back for their fifth year in Aaron Murray and Taj Boyd. The, the NFL will be there for those two guys. I don't think there's any question, but how nice is it to have a story in the positive side of those guys coming back at the top of their game in college? Both of them are going to set records this year, and it's going to be fun to watch. Aaron Murray, not Johnny Manziel, picked first-team All-SEC quarterback. A.J. McCarron's third team, and he's won two straight <laughs> national titles. Second and seven, and a short, short throw by McCarg to Taylor, who makes a nice move and is close to a first down. You know, everybody's talking about, hey, show me something, Clemson. How about Georgia? Yeah. And, and Aaron Murray and that team really needing to get a signature win. You know, it's early in the year, but, boy, if they can pull that off on the road to Clemson at night, Absolutely. And then Georgia plays South Carolina the next week. I mean, what a, what a difficult way. But if they can get through those two weeks, uh, the schedule sets up pretty good for Georgia, too. There's no question that, that people are concerned with whether Aaron Murray can lead them to a win in a big game. He convinced me in the SEC championship game a year ago. So I mean, he played as good as anybody on that field. And so he made me a believer that night. The card with a strike and a big hit by Jacobs on Dante Moore. Tom? You know, you look at Georgia the last two years, no LSU, no Alabama on the schedule, while South Carolina had the most difficult schedule with each of the last three years. South Carolina has taken care of business versus Georgia, now in the SEC East. Florida clearly with the most difficult schedule. I really want to see Georgia win tonight because that would be the second win versus a top 20 team that Aaron Murray's ever had as a starting quarterback. It's a hump game for Aaron Murray in Georgia. And of course, if Clemson can win that game, it's a big statement for the ACC, the new look ACC. Now, Florida State was disappointing last year. Thought a good year, but a lot of people were thinking national title. And then Miami. Yeah. As we've got a flag down, expectations are high for Miami with still that NCAA cloud that's been hovering for two years still there. Prior to the snap, false start, 60 offense, five yards penalty, still second down. Yeah, and we'll be in Miami next week yeah. for Florida Miami, another big SEC ACC matchup. Yeah, and Miami's got so much firepower on offense. The question will be that defense. So many young players for Al Golden are obviously coming back, having played those young players. So, how well will they perform against? An offense in Florida that so far today has struggled from all accounts. I think Herbie actually picked Toledo to beat him. Last check, Florida was it's not a comfortable lead. You got to pick an upset. You got to put somebody in upset alert. <laughs> that pass into traffic pulled in by Mario Hull, brought down at the 26 yard line for about six yards. You know, guys, I had a chance to see both Miami and Florida this past spring, and I, I think we're going to see significant improvement out of that Florida offense. Obviously, they got to get healthy, losing Chaz Green, losing Matt Jones, the running back. And then Miami, don't be surprised if they win nine or ten games this year and win that division in the ACC. Florida's got to get players on the field. A handful of guys suspended yesterday. McCarg trying to get the first down on third and three. Looks like he'll be just short. Alonzo Williams with a tackle. So fourth down, trailing by 17 with 10 and a half minutes to go. And they're going to measure here. But looks like he's short. And we talk about scheduling, and you mentioned Alabama, of course, in two weeks for AM. After that, now they still have tough SEC games, but at LSU on November 23rd is really probably the biggest challenge that remains 
for Texas A&M after the home game against Alabama. David Bailiff uh, does not like the uh, spot there. They remeasure it. He's still short, but initially they were off by a half a yard. Yeah, a and schedule is a little unique. A year ago, if you think back, they had six games at home and six games on the road. This year, they've got eight games at home, only four on the road, and they've got two four-game stretches here at home, one to start the season, and then two games on the road, and then they're back here for four straight home games. So as far as the schedule for AM, couldn't be much better uh, from a home and away standpoint this season. The road didn't hurt them last year. They were 7 0 for the first time since 1939. Their two losses were LSU here in Florida. Remember, Florida was their first game of the year. It was supposed to be their second game. And the contest with Louisiana Tech, there was weather issues, so they delayed that game. It ended up being a thriller that Johnny Manziel basically won by himself and put him on the map. Big hit at the point of attack. Charles Ross stood up. On fourth down, he'll lose yardage, and the Aggies take over on downs. Tyrone Taylor there first for a &M. Great penetration up front. This defensive line on a fourth down gets pushed and penetration and stands up Ross, and then Taylor comes in and cleans up. It's Jay Arnold, the backup defensive tackle that uh, got penetration and stood up Ross. That's the kind of defense that, that we've come to expect in the SEC, and AM hasn't really had that. And we talked with Mark Snyder, the defensive coordinator, and asked him, how far away are you from having the kind of defensive front seven that the SEC is known for and that you need? And he said, we're not there yet. We've got some young guys we're really excited about, but we need to add some more depth. Molina makes two men miss. Inside the 10, down to the 8. The third time that Johnny Manziel's been in the game where AM has started in the plus territory. And now they got a first and goal. He's already thrown two touchdown passes. He's got 19 rushing yards on six attempts. Molina's at 82 yards rushing. Manziel. Wide open in the end zone. Touchdown, Mike Evans. Third of the half for Johnny Football. And I think Rice has finally gotten tired. This is just a rub route underneath. And they work on the scramble drill a lot at Texas A&M in practice, practice. And Mike Evans, he's just going to uncover. He's not going to be open initially. Just going to keep working, keep working, try to find the open space. And he knows that the likelihood of Johnny Manziel getting outside of the pocket is high. So they work on those routes constantly in practice in extending the play and finding the open area. And then Manziel gets him the ball. Penalty flag on the play. Look at this. After the touchdown, twenty-six touchdown passes last year for Manziel. Three, and just over a quarter here today. Following the touchdown, unsportsmanlike conduct, number two of the offense. <laughs> 15-yard penalty will have the try. Well, a lot of people are on college football that are kind of tired of this. Is that really necessary? You, you just proved yourself in what you did on the field. That, that's twice now. Now, we did see some guys harassing him in the first half, faking as if they were signing yep. autographs, and that got Johnny upset. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. That happens every single game in football. You can't react. You've got to control yourself and be a leader. We asked Kevin Sumlin yesterday if he thinks Johnny has matured. He said yes. That's yet to be determined. Back here at uh, Kyle Field where Johnny Manziel just took a 15-yard unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. He was in the face of two Rice defensive players after throwing the touchdown pass, Darian Pollard and Malcolm Hill. They listened to him for a while, didn't say anything back. The referees came up and heard it. As Manziel went back and the flag was thrown, Kevin Sumlin ran down the sidelines, ran right up in his grill and said, God dang it, that's the stupidest thing I've heard in my life. And he pulled Manziel back to the sideline.
not happy. Well, Kenny Hill warming up. That might be it for, for Manziel today. Going off that right there helped the decision by Kevin Sumlin. Guys, I, I, it just comes down to personal accountability and choices. I, I referenced how impulsive he is. It's those types of situations. If people want to make excuses, that's all on him. It's all about choices. You want people to lay off you? Do the right thing. Short kickoff by Bertolette. And here's Pollard. And Pollard up near the 25-yard line. Here's Reese. Notre Dame off to a good start against Temple. Tommy Reese. We'll find Devaris Daniels. Reese hit his first three passes. Notre Dame scored a couple of touchdowns on the board. And still in the first quarter, fighting Irish up 14-0. Daniels has both touchdown catches. All right, Reese. Dreyfus Jackson into the game at quarterback for Rice. Down 24 to AM. And a first down for the Owls, who were down just seven at halftime before Johnny Manziel came in the game. And Jackson will hand it off. And Ross gets to the 30-yard line. Johnny Manziel right now, he, he is the face of college football. When, when people watch him, they love what he does on the field, but the extracurricular stuff, it shows a lack of class. Yeah, you just have to anticipate that people are going to say things about you. And, and you're in a position, whether it's right or wrong, where people are looking up to you. And the way that you handle yourself means something to a lot of people. And, and Johnny has failed to realize that or embrace that. And I think he just continues to operate from the standpoint that it's it's all about him and and unfortunately when you get in these situations and you're in a game he feels like that's his sanctuary and no matter what happens out there he's okay uh, but when you have somebody that says something to you defensive player you don't need to react you just walk away look where the game's in hand we're beating you on the scoreboard in the end you're hurting your team it's, it's not just about you you're hurting yeah. your team you're hurting your coach and these are the reasons why when they elect captains at AM, they didn't elect him he's their best player by far best player in college football a year ago but he's not the best leader that's that's the end of the day third down and six and Jackson pumps takes off and spun down right at the first down marker you know you mentioned it being a sanctuary you're exactly right Brian it's like he's in his own little invisible bubble and there's no thought of consequence and all the things that make him so good he can't seem to draw that line between when to shut that off and when to apply it to production on the field. And if he doesn't learn it, you know, if people want to talk about the NFL and potential options a year or two years from now, he's got to understand what part of his game is going to be scrutinized the most, and it's not the on-field play. If I can tell you from talking to NFL scouts already, they're concerned. Yeah. They're concerned not about the on-the-field stuff as well as the extracurricular things that he does is Jackson had a nice run up near midfield before he's brought down. I, I mean, I don't even want to have the conversation about the NFL with Johnny Manziel. That's so far away, right? I mean, I, I'm interested in how this affects this team this year, two weeks from now when Alabama comes in. What do you think that Alabama defense is going to say to him, especially after watching this film and his reaction? Oh, we got a cheap 15 yards. Right. Just say something about him signing something and you'll get 15. They're going to they're going to be relentless with him two weeks from now. Here's Ross, and he runs over Matthews again, close to 10 yards on the play. No, Johnny Manziel, when, when he has that opportunity here, you know, I, I think so much of that game in two weeks versus Alabama is, is going to be about Johnny Manziel managing his emotions as much as it is about managing the game. I actually believe most of the pressure will be on A.J. McCarron uh, coming into this stadium with the team that apparently has had this on their bulletin board now, obviously, for a year. but. Managing emotions for Johnny Manziel is, is to a critical mass right now. He managed him well early here with all the hype coming out and playing well with three touchdown passes, but Dreyfus Jackson sacked as Sean Washington forces the fumble. Ball on the ground at the 47, and Rice gets it back. Hey, don't you think in the end, Brian, that fans, they'll, they'll overlook 
you know, some of the stuff that maybe we, we build up too much, yeah. you know, showing up in a Tebow jersey at a frat party or going to a Miami Heat game and having a great seat. They'll, they'll look past that, but it's, it's when on the field you lose control, that's when people are going to have a problem. Well, his, his game is all about getting out of control, right? So uh, that's what people love about him. But uh, And at the end of the day, the only thing that his teammates care about is how well Johnny Manziel plays. And, and, when, and, and so far, he's shown that he can play well. Even amid all the controversy, he's going to play well. And I think he's going to play well this season. But when you start to have penalties that affect your team and things of that nature, then that's, that's when teammates start to say, wait a minute. You know, we talked with Kevin Sumlin about it, and obviously they're isolated with two days. And he said, he said, you know, we had the heartbeat of what was going on with the team because we talked to our captains a lot about it. And again, they reiterated to us several times, this was not an issue at all internally. You wonder with things like that, might it become one as the season goes on? And what I, kind of conversation do they have after the game, Sumlin and Mansell? Personal foul, number 10, defense for fighting. 15-yard penalty, player is ejected. So Deshaun Hall, a true freshman, losing his cool. I think Kevin Sumlin will take, take control of this situation. You know, obviously, when you have... A leader, your quarterback, your best player that shows that his emotions get out of control and then other players start to follow suit. That's part of, of being a leader. And, and right now the leadership needs to come from Kevin Sumlin to get a little bit of control over his team. First down for Rice inside the AM 35. There's Dillard, big hole. Brought down inside the 25 after a gain of eight. Sam Moeller, who's the 12th man today, wearing the number 12, makes the tackle. Rice with over 500 yards of offense in this game. There's a lot to clean up defensively for AM. They're going to get out of here with the win, but. Rice has had the better, had better hand on them most of this football game. Jackson finds a seam, another flag down. Jackson is brought down at the 18 after getting the first down. And remember, with the suspensions of Jenkins, Harris, and Stansbury for one more game, you're not going to get a full game as a group defensively until the Alabama game. No, that's significant. You know, if it was one game or half a game, it's another story. But Shot two block. games. Offense, 53. 15-yard to pay for the previous spot. Repeat second down. That's, that's a, it's like coming out in your first game against Alabama. There's all kinds of things that you're going to learn from game one to game two. And coaches love the learning process from one to two. So uh, they're going to be a significant disadvantage with having those guys suspended the first two games. The Shays are Everett back after being suspended the first half. They'll have Kirby Ennis back for their game against Sam Houston State next week. But Harris, Jenkins, and Stansbury will have to sit out one more game for violating Texas A&M athletic department rules and regulations. Four and a half to go here in College Station. Second and 17. Jackson completes it to the 35-yard line. Derek Brown on the reception, but only a gain of four on the play. No Rice hoping to be a competitor in the New Look Conference USA. You had several of the teams from that league defect to the New York American Athletic Conference. Most feel that Louisville is the favorite to not only win that league, but because of the schedule, have a chance to go undefeated and be in the mix to play in the BCS championship game. In the final year of the BCS. Jackson in trouble on third and 13. Gets away from Taylor. His pass off the mark. And a big hit by Everett on Kubiak. And if that's targeting, he's gone. The new rule in college football is if you get penalized for targeting, it's an automatic ejection. And this guy already missed the first half because of the suspension. He may not be around to see the end of the second half. Well, he's, there has, there's two elements to, to the rule. You have to be targeting, then you also have to have 
contact between his the crown of his helmet and and the in the defenseless player and that didn't happen there that was a shoulder to the chest head to the side and so that's not an ejection well, it's a it's a defenseless player that may be the penalty but it's awfully close to being around the chin and if they initially rule it targeting they can look at it upstairs to determine whether the player should be ejected. The, the penalty marker would still stand. They want to confirm. If you're going to eject somebody, they just want to use instant replay to confirm that there was a helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact, which I don't think was ha happened right there. So they could just say a, a defenseless player here and still would be 15 yards. Although Everett is running to the sideline. Foul. Defense number 29 targeting a defenseless player. By rule, number 29 is disqualified. Now again, they can first review this to determine whether he should be ejected. The penalty flag still stands. Remember, he has to have contact in the head or neck area. And right there, he hits him in the chest. But didn't he lower, didn't he lower his head and launch, well, hitting him with the crown? This, this, is, this is the new rule. It's going to be the most controversial rule in college football this year. And there's so much gray area here, but the rule as it was stated was contact in the head or neck area. Or with the head. Leading with, with the, the head, yes. And again, we're looking at it right now. And officials are going to watch for, is the defender sizing up the guy? Is he crouching, ready to leap and attack? That, that was a part of the decision to throw the flag initially, the targeting. That's what, it, that's what those, those crouching and target that's that's the first flag right now they're just going to see the if Texas he hit his head head coach has called timeout to challenge the call of targeting on the field again all they're doing is challenging whether ever should be ejected the, the penalty flag is still going to stand yeah. at 15 yards now the game has pretty much been over for about 10 minutes but the action has not The ejection stands. I don't know if I've ever heard a player get suspended for the first half of consecutive games, but that's the case with Everett getting ejected here in the fourth quarter. He's got to sit out the first half of next week's game. He already missed the first half of this game because of suspension. Another penalty flag. Prior to the snap, false start, 76 offense, five-yard penalty, still first down. I, I, and I, I've got to defend this Chaser Everett. He's got to hit the guy. And, and I think there's no malicious intent there. He's a defenseless receiver just because the ball was thrown high, and he's got to hit him. And I think he did his best to hit him in the chest with his shoulder. And I think early in the season, especially, officials are going to err on the side of caution. It's an unfortunate development for the Chaser Everett. And on the run, Jackson throws it out of bounds. It's a judgment call. And even if well, they can say, okay, he's not ejected, you can't take away the penalty because it's a, yeah. it's a judgment call made by the officials on a bang-bang play. And that's the same rule as, as it was a year ago. Everybody needs to understand. It's the same rule. They just now have added an element of replay to confirm if you're going to give the official the opportunity to eject somebody, they want to make sure that there's been contact in the head or neck area. And that's why they use replay. Jackson, nobody to pitch it to. And he still does a great job to keep the feet moving and get to the 23-yard line. Only a couple to bring up third down. And got an injured owl. It's Nate Richards. The interesting here, if AM gets the ball back and there's not a lot of time on the clock, does he go back to Jokel rather than perhaps burn the red shirt of Kenny Hill, or have they already made the decision? That, uh, that Hill is going to play this year. I think they want to play Hill. We'll see what happens after third down or third down and 13. With only two races left until the chase for the cup, Jimmy Johnson looks to maintain the lead on the field as the competition heats up at Atlanta Motor Speedway. The NASCAR Sprint Cup Series at Atlanta Sunday at 7 on ESPN, also live on a watch ESPN. And Joker was solid in the first half. The problem with AM in the first half was not him. 
He was 14 of 19 for 190 yards at a touchdown. It was the defense, and there were there weren't turnovers by AM. It just was Rice marching down the field on consecutive possessions against them. Yeah, and I think no matter what happens with, with Kenny Hill, I think Matt Jokel is going to be the backup quarterback this year. He proved that. He earned that in this game in the first half. And talking with Clarence McKinney, just feels more comfortable with Jokel's grasp of the offense. But Kenny Hill brings a good skill set that's different. It's more like Johnny Manziel, but he's still learning what to do in this offense and not necessarily why or how to do it. Third down and long. Jackson grabbed and then sacked at the 25-yard line. Tyrone Taylor hit him high, and then Tommy Sanders came in to clean him up. The A&M coaches are really high on Tyrone Taylor, a redshirt freshman from Houston, along with his twin brother Tyrell Taylor. Tyrell wears number 35. And they're going to need them, especially in third down situations like that as this season goes on because they lost to Montre Moore, who was uh, their sack leader a year ago, now in the NFL. They've got to find between the Taylor twins and maybe Deshaun Hall, somebody that can get off the edge and get to the quarterback. 43-yard field goal try is good. A&M will win the game, but Rice puts up 31 points just outside two minutes to go in the fourth. ESPN College Football is presented by Cars.com. Get the right car without all the drama. Cars.com. All drive, no drama. And in part by AT&T. Rethink possible. ESPN College Football presented by Cars.com. Texas A&M 52, Rice 31. Johnny Manziel in about a quarter and a half of work. Six of eight passing, three touchdowns, 94 yards through the air. And on the ground, six carries, 19 yards. Also got a penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct. Jarring, uh, jarring with a couple of Rice players after a touchdown pass to Mike Evans. And a huge kick that sails through the end zone and comes out to the 25-yard line for Texas A&M. Saturday Night Football on ABC kicks off under the lights in Death Valley. Aaron Murray against Taj Boyd, Georgia, and Clemson. Saturday Night Football presented by Windows, part of Dick's Sporting Goods kickoff week. You like Clemson in this one? Well, you know, Taj Boyd's got so many weapons. When you, when you come out of the first game of the season in prime time, you're going to play Georgia, and they have two freshmen, true freshmen starting in the secondary. That gets you excited. You know, yeah. As a quarterback, that would get me excited. I, I fully expect Taj Boyd to be on point tonight. Here's Bryce. Dole's all on the carry. By the way, Matt Jokel is out there. Yeah. So they, they don't burn the red shirt of Kenny Hill. Now, this could be because they don't want to get Manziel hurt, or this is a message to Manziel after the taunting nah. by taking him out. Yeah, I, I think even if that whole penalty with Manziel didn't happen, I think you still are going to put Jokel back in the ballgame. People think that this Clemson offense you know, can't operate because, you know, they lose New Coppins and they lose Andre Ellington. But they've got some guys, Martavius Bryant, Sharon Peak, they still have Jamez Logan, that they've got plenty of weapons on offense to, to compete tonight with Georgia. Those all up to the 29-yard line. Is Clemson the team to beat in the ACC? Well, it's between Clemson, obviously, and Miami, I think, in my opinion. I think Florida those, State. Those two, no, I, you know, Florida State, to me, you know, when you have a, a, a quarterback that's playing for the first time, despite the fact that he's very talented, and I think he's going to be a good player. Janice Winston. You know, it's not going to be, you're not going to have a Johnny Manziel effect every every year, right? You can't just plug a guy in and, oh my gosh, you have instant offense. Maybe that happens with Winston, but I wouldn't say they're the favorite coming in because of that. They'll run the ball again, Dolezal. Will come up short of the first down. Looks like they'll have to snap it one more time before the end of the ball game. Coming up, what about an hour from Atlanta?
Dick Sporting Goods kickoff week continues with A.J. McCarron wearing a walking boot yesterday, expected to go for Alabama today against Virginia Tech. Then in Dallas, LSU and TCU. They will not have to snap it here in College Station. That's the end of the ball game. Terrific effort by Rice. Terrific performance by Manziel and limited action. Three touchdown passes and eight tries. And it was a seven-point game at halftime. Manziel came in. They took advantage of turnovers. And they win it 52 to 31. Sam Houston State is next for Texas A&M. Then two weeks from today, it'll be A&M and Alabama. Matt Jokel started for Texas A&M, finished with 190 yards passing and a touchdown. Some things to work on for defense. They'll get some players that were suspended back. Others have to sit out one more game as Texas A&M wins it. 52-31, Kevin Sumlin now with Tom Luganville. Well, Coach, you got through this one. Obviously a foolish penalty on behalf of your quarterback there in the fourth quarter. What was your reaction to that? Well, you know, that, that wasn't very smart. And, uh, you know, that's why uh, he didn't go back in the game either. So, you know, um, you, you would hope at this point we'd learn something from that. And we're still, we're still working on that, and that's why uh, he wasn't going back in the game no matter what was happening. Um, but, I, you know, it, we played, uh, somebody just told me we played 15 true freshmen, 21st time guys, and it looked like it, particularly on defense. Uh, but we got great video to teach off of. We got some good young players. We just got to get them more confident, and we'll be ready to go next week. Six starters missing, obviously, on defense today. The majority of those freshmen playing in your front seven. Right. How do you address some of the issues on defense so far? And it's, still, it's just the first game. Yeah, well, we got uh, those guys are first-time players, you know, and... Uh, a lot of our veteran guys that weren't in the game, uh, we got to get, get uh, those guys back. But these young guys got a lot of video to learn off of. They came here to play, and uh, you know we got to go back to work next week. But but the big thing is we got out of here with a victory, and uh, you know we move on to next week. Good luck, coach. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. So it was a message. The question, as it always is with Johnny Manziel, will it be heard and acted upon? We'll find out. Johnny Manziel in his 2013 debut, about a quarter and a half throws for three touchdowns. AM beats Rice 52 31. College football scoreboard coming up next. Then it's Bama, two time defending national champs facing Virginia Tech. For Brian Greasy, Tom Lugan, Bill Mark Schwartz, our entire ESPN crew. I'm Dave Pash. So long from College Station.